This programme features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello, hello everybody and a very good afternoon from the Maasai Mara. We're in the Mara Triangle in Kenya and we got zebra opening our sunset drive for today. And what a day it is and as usual, my name is David and with me on camera today, remind me your name sir, I think that's James. James has given me a very big warning today, not call him Big James anymore, I've always called him Big James. But he said that should stop, hi James. Are you excited? Yes. Very good. James is very excited. He has seen some old friends from America and I think he's smiling. I don't know what's happening between him and them. Woo. But most important, we are just sitting on the Mara River on a warm day and watching zebras that we think we might have a potential crossing of the river in maybe, I do not know when they will do that. We've been sitting here for the last uh, one hour and a half. Remember, this is a very interactive uh, drive that we do and your questions are very welcome and as usual you can send your question through or comment hashtag safari live as i said earlier we are coming to you live from the mara triangle in kenya and we got zebra sitting or waiting very close to the Mara or the mara river which runs from kenya through to tanzania a country south of kenya and it drains in lake victoria so we're just here crossing fingers and waiting to see if they're going to cross. That's the river they might cross. And they all know the dangers of crossing that river. What you can see there, those are hippos. But apart from the hippos, the zebras also know we've got lots of big, huge reptiles in, in this river in the name of the Nile crocodiles. That are huge, massive, and it's always very dangerous to cross here. So they'll always take the time until we get one leader who will get good courage and come and cross over. Patience is very important for us and we are never in a rush. So once you're out in the African bush, you need to learn patience. Sorry, what did Lee ask Lou? Richie, I'll tell you something. It's very difficult to know who will take the first chance to cross the river. It's always a very dangerous game, and it depends on the leader or who builds the courage first. And ideally, as I said earlier, Richie, they all know the dangers of crossing that river, and nobody will want to die. So you go first, you're like thinking you might die, but apparently out of experience, whoever goes in first, the crocodiles don't go for her or for him. They keep crossing, you might see about 10, 15, 20 of them crossing, and maybe the 25th or the 30th one, that's when the crocodiles start coming in. Once they know that the zebras have the system or are used just to crossing. We're just looking at them now, Richie, and maybe the one in front could take the lead. And at times you have seen zebras and wildebeest together trying to cross the river and out of experience, zebras will always go in fast. So they are looking in the direction of the river and I think they are just calculating, do we go or don't we go? Well, remember, I am not the only one out here in the African doing safari. In South Africa, I got another brother by the name of Steve and he might have some good surprise for you. Yes, indeed. Thank you, David. We have found for you, boys and girls, a beautiful young male leopard by the name of Hosanna. He's about two and a half years, just over two and a half years. Good afternoon. My name is Steve. Welcome to Sabi Sands, South Africa. I'm joined on camera by VM, and we're coming to you from a very nice and warm 36 degrees Celsius, 97 degrees Fahrenheit. It is warm. That's why this guy is sitting in the shade. We're not far away at all from a small watering point, probably about, let me guess, 30, 40 meters over my shoulder. Uh, he knows if he hangs around close to the watering points, the animals are going to come down. Animals like impala and kudu, 
come down and drink and that is when he is in his prime sort of state to catch them. He's made a very good show of it in the last few weeks, spending a lot of time around some of the watering holes in and around Juma, which is in the Sabi Sands in South Africa. And it is our winter coming into, we are in spring at the moment, in fact. Hello everybody, yes, welcome back. I just got back from leave this, yesterday afternoon and uh, I'm now back at work fantastic what a job we have out here i have we've driven out found my favorite leopard in the whole world it took us all a part of about two minutes to come to where he was found this morning don't forget to send through your questions we'd love to hear from you let your teacher know what you'd like to talk about here is a beautiful male leopard as i said hosana which means little chief He's kind of got the heir to the throne, so to speak. His dad is the reigning Duke of Juma, Tingana. But it's unusual for a male to stay in his natal area. So by the time he becomes sexually mature, he'll move over somewhere else where his genetics will flow. But anyway, it's not only me out in the windy and warm Juma, South Africa. We're joined this afternoon also by a lady by the name of Taylor. Good afternoon everybody. Look at what we're starting with, my favourite animal in the whole wide world. And mom is ushering that little one on, making sure it doesn't get stuck in traffic. Although, the only traffic we're going to get stuck in is the one that the elephants cause and any other animals. But how cool is that? What an awesome way to start the afternoon safari. On that happy note, my name is Taylor McCurdy and on camera with me today is Senzo and we are going to be exploring the wilderness and hopefully finding all sorts of wonderful animals. Where do our elephants go now? I saw them when I was driving in now this afternoon. Well, I don't know if we will see them again. We'll try and have a quick look. I'm also trying to be quite... Do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to turn around. I'll tell you why I'm going to turn around. It's because James is leaving to go on holiday today and he's got to come down this road and he thought he was his last safari was this morning ha 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 we're gonna catch him what is the time he should he should be leaving now actually i'm waiting waiting to spot them you know me how i like to catch everybody when they either a or b going on a run or coming back from a run oh, there's one elephant we can watch and I'm even going to pull off the road so that they don't know when they come around the corner. <laughs> it's not going to be the greatest view, I'm afraid. <laughs> it's not going to be very nice. It's, sorry, Senza. We'll just show everyone very quickly and then we'll carry on. So as you can see, the elephants have become invisible. And that's just because of all of the, uh, all the trees that they're moving into. They're obviously looking for food. And we know that the elephants are stripping the bark off of trees at this time of the year. So... Why not head into a wooded forest like the ones that they're in at the moment? And they're just going to nibble away. They have already had a mud bath. I, I don't know if they maybe came from Simbambili side or maybe if even from Red Dam on Arethusa because they're all caked in mud. And they're heading east. And on a hot, blustery day like today, they could quite easily go for another drink again. So maybe we'll catch up with them a little bit later. Maybe they'll end up... Maybe a Gallego Pan, or perhaps they'll go even further and go down towards Bivelzook Dam. But it's hard to say. But there we go. That was nice to just have a quick glimpse of the elephants. And now we get to see the rear end of one. Well, especially if it's a little one. It's quite cute, in fact. Okay. Off we go. I don't know what we're going to be doing this afternoon. I actually have... I have actually got absolutely no idea. Oh... Gizmo, you suggested that I should jump out and scare James. Hmm. See, that's uh, you see the problem is, is that I don't know when he, he's leaving camp. But it should be between now and 4 p.m. I think they'd probably leave soon. I saw James had his bags, all his bags packed. So I, I'm, I'm assuming they were getting ready. <laughs> but to try and catch them on the road. Hmm. We'll see, we'll see, we'll see. And we don't have enough spies in camp to go lingering around to see if the company car has left just yet. Oh, we should totally set up a fake roadblock. I wish I could stand here as if I had, you know, um, a, a, one of those lasers that um, catch people speeding. 
Have you ever seen them? I've seen some funny things in South Africa. South Africans are hilarious, where they've got like empty beer bottles just on a stick turned the other way and looking through it and doing that to people as they drive past and they've got just you know maybe a construction you know vest that's yellow and orange on and that's it and people you see them hitting the brakes slamming the brakes trying to stop because you know they think the cops are gonna get them so funny i actually think i might do that in my spare time <laughs> let's just go out and, and torment people <laughs> They weren't even delinquent teenagers, Louise, they were adults, full-grown full adults, as they should be. Where are they? Louise, please can you ask one of the spies of Final Control to see if the company vehicle is left just yet? Because, I, I listen, I mean, I can take 30 minutes to drive on this road if I need to. I'll go back, I'll do it in reverse. It would be really funny if I could get, if I could get them and do some trapping. How do you think I could do this? <laughs> Lou says that she thinks that we should time. Oh, there's some kudu for you to look at while we wait. Um, we should time how long it takes for me to go forwards and where to access and then do it in reverse. I'd probably be quicker in reverse. So now those kudus have got the right idea today. Hiding about uh, amongst all the guari trees, that's what they're doing. I'm sure having a little nibble here and there, but again, there isn't very much for them to eat at the moment so I think they're just trying to conserve their energy and hide away in the shade that's exactly what I'd be doing and of course it's super super windy as you can see so they're probably getting a bit of shelter in there too and we all know for those new viewers that don't know animals don't really like the wind so I'm surprised that we've actually seen elephants and that we've now got kudu they normally try and keep out of it because their senses you know, don't work so well, they can't hear as well, the scents get blown around in circles and that's no good when you're trying to look out or listen out for predators. But they'll be alright, this isn't their first rodeo, they've had many a windy day and, uh, and this is the time of the year where the wind does blow, but we have beautiful days. I actually don't even know how hot it is today, but this berg wind, whew, it's unpleasant, it's not particularly nice. I'm gonna guess, it feels like it's like 34, 35 degrees Celsius, but I don't know, it's probably gonna be less because the internet lies to us all the time about what the weather actually is. I have an argument with the, the temperature all the time. Okay, I'm gonna keep thinking on how I can prank James. Off you go to Steve, he's not pranking anybody because he really has a leopard. <laughs> no, no need to prank him, shame. I can't imagine the look on James's face. He's been here for 12 weeks, folks. He needs a break. He's looking rather good, actually. I saw him this morning and last night. He's looking quite strong. I think he's happy to be getting a bit of leave. I hope Taylor doesn't prank him too badly. Um, <laughs> anyway, I apologize for my mistake earlier. I had a, an email saying we had a school drive starting at 3.30, but it has changed to quarter to six. So I do apologize. And hello to everybody. Thank you for the well wishes back from leave. It is wonderful to be back and wonderful to be back on the vehicle with VM, the Wildebeest. Uh, we haven't worked together since February. Can you believe that? February? Can't believe it. It's just time has flown by. But anyway, we are indeed with the little chief who has been doing his thing of late, as we all know, spending time around the watering holes, keeping himself nice and fit. And I believe he finished an Impala and a Nyala very recently. He's making many, many kills. Magic Dragon Wizard. Well, he's not really that lazy. Um, it is very hot. Uh, it is very, very warm. Uh, this is exactly what all cats do in this kind of weather, even dogs. You just, it's just too much energy to spend it out there. And if he's got food in his belly, there's no need to do anything. You can see him panting, the, the, the fullness of his belly pushing up the diaphragm. There's some cooling that happens in the, the nose and then a fair amount of it which happens on the feet as we were spending a lot of time with the thermal camera with these cats, lions and leopards alike you could quite easily see how nice, nicely uh, insulated the body was and then the feet really radiated that heat which is very very cool to be able to see that from a, from a sort of a, a more technical level 
We've learned lots and lots over the last few months. Have you been playing with the, the thermal VM? Enjoying it? Okay, so you, VM used it last year, I didn't realize that, but I know that Dave and Seb and all the boys this side were really enjoying using it the last few months. And uh, now we have it as a, stand, as, a, as a standard issue. We will be whipping it out later, I believe. Anyway, I don't think Hosanna is going anywhere. We're going to make a little bit of space for a vehicle that's coming in behind us and we're going to go check a few of the watering holes, see if we can find ourselves some elephants and then we'll make our way back here a little bit later because I'm sure this lazy cat, as you all mentioned, is not going anywhere. So let us move out as Texan comes in behind me. Maybe we'll go check Chitra. This seems like the, the perfect kind of time to be checking Chitra watering hole, I think. There we go. Some viewers came to visit us a little while ago. They're on the back of the vehicle there with Texan. Okay. And take their photos and selfies with us. Always nice to see. So it's quite interesting for me when you meet people that I've obviously seen my face before, know my name, and they introduce themselves to you as if you've seen them before, and it's not the case. But lovely to meet all of you when you do come and visit. I'm going to spend your time here in the Sabi Sands, and as you know, this is the time of year. Maybe a little bit late in the time of year, because it is getting very warm. And I've just come back from leave, but it was nice. I had some time down by the coast in the sunshine, swimming in the very nice ocean. Well, we're going to be going all the way up to David in the Mara, which I think is a lot cooler, and I think he's got himself some zebra. Well, well done, Steve. Uh, leopards are always interesting to watch, but I think because of the heat of the day, they may choose at the moment to be a bit sleepy and just slow down but here we have a different ball game all together we got some big water animals and if you look carefully there we got some hippopotamus huge hippos and these hippos are in the Mara River and you can see the current of the water at that particular point and when you see the current going a little fast there that's what we expect And that's why we, where we expect the uh, zebras to be crossing from. It looks a bit dangerous, and you can see the water going up and down like that. It means there's so many rocks there. But these animals, you know, they really don't care. And sometimes they usually make so many mistakes, and when they misjudge, they still end up crossing at that point you see there. But and like yesterday when we saw them crossing, they pushed the hippos out of the way for them to cross. The Mara River is one of the longest rivers we got in East Africa and it originates on some highlands of Kenya and it flows for about 400 kilometers which is about 250 miles uh, odds and I would say 65% of this river is in Kenya and about 35% of it is in a country called Tanzania. The river flows down and goes and drains in Lake Victoria. Lake Victoria is a lake shared by Kenya, Tanzania and another country west of Kenya called Uganda. And apparently Lake Victoria is the source of the longest river in Africa called the Nile River, which drains in the Mediterranean Sea. So what I'm saying, the water you're watching here at one point will flow from the highlands of Kenya, the Mara River in Kenya, all the way to Tanzania, and then finally to Lake Victoria, ending up in the uh, Mediterranean. So not sure these zebras want to cross, but when you look at them there, they're looking to cross like from a different point. It always depends on the leader. It always depends who will have very strong nerves and take the chance of, you know, risking to be brought down by the crocodiles. Romet, zebras, and especially this particular species we got here, this one is what we call the plains zebra or the common zebra. 
It could be anything from a small herd of five and a typical set of a uh, social structure of a zebra is one male and maybe two wives, three wives and some youngsters. But we have seen some huge, huge herds of zebras, almost up to 500. So raw meat, I would say anything from five to about 100 times as much to 500, it's very possible. And more so during the migration, I have personally seen about 3,000 strong zebras moving together with wildebeest. So it depends sometimes, or oh, that figure is determined mainly Romet, by resources of food, or two, when they need to move. When they need to move, they congregate together, and of course, as usual, Romet, you know, safety in numbers. It's a bit warm today, over or almost close to 30 degrees Celsius, so they might be staying there just, you know, flicking their tails and waiting to see who will have the courage to get into water fast. Remember, as I said earlier, keep asking us questions as we show hashtag Safari Live, or if you have any comment, you can always bring them to us. There's Rima, as you watch that crocodile there, and I think very good timing for your question, that determines where they will cross because those animals in the water are the deterrent. So if they come so close to the river and they see crocs, for example, that one there, Rima, they'll definitely do a very quick U-turn. There's another croc there. So the leader comes, first does a very quick survey, makes a decision, do we cross from here or not? Crocodiles, Rima, I'm sure you know, they got a very special eyelid and underwater they'll be comfortably able to open their eyes and they can see what is happening on the outside world. There's one huge croc out there. James, if you can just bring that croc to the center, uh, the one on the bank. Yeah, just bring it to the center of the frame. So, yes, that's on the bank the other way, James. Go up, go up, keep going, keep going, very good. There. You see how that one blends in very well. So it is there and it blends in very well with those rocks there. But if zebras come, choose to cross from that point and see that croc there, very quickly they make a U-turn. They have known many times they have plunged themselves in water and have been caught off guard by the crocs that they had not seen before. So patience, as I said earlier, it's very important for us. In the backdrop there, what you see is an escarpment, and that escarpment there is called the Olololo Escarpment. And as I was opening the, the drive today, I said we're in the Mara Triangle, and we call it the Mara Triangle, and like any standard triangle has three arms. So one of the arms of the triangle is that escarpment you see there, that is called the Olololo Escarpment. And of course, the river that we have been watching, the Mara River, is the other arm of the triangle. And then the other arm of the triangle is the boundary between Kenya and Tanzania. So that's how we end up with the Mara Triangle that way, that way. All around the escarpment, the Mara River, and at the base here, we've got the boundary between Kenya and Tanzania. So we go back to our zebras, closely watch them, and find out if any of them will have courage to cross. Remember, as I said earlier, if you have any questions, you may bring them through as usual, hashtag Safari Live. Any comments you may have, please, it's also very welcome. What a sighting we got here, just waiting to see if anybody have the courage to go in fast. Sometimes they need to build the pressure from the back and they keep pushing one another. They keep pushing, like you see them walking there. So if the pressure is so much from the back, the one in the front tend to bulge like two meters in front, three meters, one meter, until they get very close to the water. We'll always sit, wait, watch, become very patient. We like drinking lots of water. James loves water. And James will carry about three liters of water every day when myself I carry about one liter of water. I got a feeling at one point they must cruise and they'll always cruise not for any other reason, for food resources. Well, again, as I said, I'm not alone here. During the drive, we got Taylor in South Africa. Let us hear what's the latest from her.
not much David not much at all so we were we were gonna set up a roadblock for James but now we've got school drive starting at four o'clock so we won't be able to do that but basically what I'd done is I'd pulled a whole lot of dead branches out into the middle of the road and then James is gonna have to stop and then I was gonna get out and I was also gonna use my like spotlight to like wave him down I don't know I did, hadn't quite figured that one out just got my sunglasses on I was gonna be like the cool cop and go and ask for a license and registration please and sir have you been drinking and driving <laughs> <laughs> saying like all random things go around check the quality of the tires the windscreen all those types of things and then find them either way they were gonna get in trouble with the law today the law being me <laughs> anyway so I wanted to do that I would have loved to have seen James's face he would have just probably sat there going like this that dissipate that disappointed head shake that he does to me all the time <laughs> so yeah oh well next time when he comes back We'll try and do that to him. Also, he hasn't left camp yet, so that doesn't help us either. I don't know where to go, Senzo. Steve's going to Chitwa. Mm. Oh, guinea fowl. Let's go for them. We shall have a look at the guinea fowl. Here they are. It would have been even funnier if I could have done it. I was so excited. Senzo and I was so amped. I just wish I would have had like a reflective coat. I mean, I think I need to keep a bag of props. There's the guinea fowl. Hello, guinea fowl. Also very hot, probably complaining about the weather. What are you even eating? There's nothing for you to eat. He's just pecking at the ground aimlessly and hoping that you get something. I don't know what they're going for. Maybe they're using the same tactic as the... Was it the Franklins that were doing it? They were pecking at the patches of grass, hoping to find some insects that were hiding underneath all that grass for a bit of shelter, maybe for some food too. I feel like the guinea fowl do travel some serious distance in a day as they forage on the ground. There are a few little grasshoppers around, but they're really small. Vim and I saw one this morning. We were very excited because it was like the first insect I'd seen since I'd been back. <laughs> well, out uh, on bushwalk. So we had a look at that and then we just had some technical difficulties so we couldn't show you. So maybe that's what the guinea fowl are also going after if they can catch one. Although, guinea fowl actually eat deceivingly quick. When they take off, they've got great acceleration speed. And I think my favorite example of this is when we're down at Chitwa Dam just as the sun is setting and the entire population of guinea fowl and the sabi sand uh, come to roost on that one dead tree. And then you see them chasing after one another after a last drink before they perch up on the branches. And then it's normally quite funny to see them like ruffle one another's feathers quite easily. This is lovely. Just carrying on, doing their thing, not moving too quickly, probably because it's so hot. It's actually very quiet in terms of birds. I think we might have to enter into the Mulwati and um, maybe look for some birds. Okay, dogs. <laughs> Where, where we're gonna go. We want to get out of the wind though. So perhaps we'll try the Mulwati, although I don't know if it's actually going to be much help. We'll give it a bash anyways. Is everybody still alive in final control? Senzel's just done this, he's like he's he's not sure.
maybe somebody's put sleeping gas into the air vents and they've all gone to bed. No, I can hear you, Louise. I was just making a joke of how quiet it was for a second. Mm, okay, what do you think, Sensor? Do you think we should go? Should we go? Oh, we've still got a while to get to the Malwati. I don't know which way Steve went. If he went via Chitwa Dam, I mean, not Chitwa Dam, via Treehouse Dam, maybe we should quickly zip round and then go into the Malwati. Maybe we should do that to like Mamba Junction. I think that'll be the plan. Okie dokie. Well, you've heard our plan. We're going to head to some watering holes and then into the mighty Mulwati drainage system and hope to find life. Off you go to Steve and see if he's at Chitwa. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome, boys and girls from Okmulgi uh, Ace High School. Welcome to South Africa. Sorry, in the Juma, in the Sabi Sand, South Africa. My name is Steve. I'm joined by VM on camera, and it is a beautiful 36 degrees Celsius, 97 degrees Fahrenheit. We were with the male leopard not long ago, and we did leave him because it's very, very hot. He's just sleeping, doing absolutely nothing. So our plan for the afternoon is to go down and check some watering holes, and that's where animals are going to go. Uh, the leopard in question not far away from a watering hole but he's not moving so maybe we'll just pop in there quickly seeing as you didn't get to see him with a bit of a detail uh, alarm calls coming from not far away and alarm calls are basically animals shouting at other predators such as lions and leopards it's something that we use all the time to find our leopards out here as we listen to the birds as they shout and sometimes the impala I'll show you some impala in a moment we're going to have a look at these impala and they make a very loud snorting sort of sound which makes it quite easy to sort of identify that they're looking at something but then you've got to find that animal so sometimes it's not that easy please feel free to send your questions through with your teachers let us know what you'd like to talk about this afternoon this is interactive and exciting we're out in the, the winter coming into spring of South Africa and here is the first animal in question perched beautifully on a termite mound on the right hand side is our first antelope, the impala. And these are perfect leopard food. They are perfect everyone's food in fact because of the size that they have. They are not a very big antelope, medium sized antelope can get up to maybe 120, 30 pounds at the most. So it's quite small in comparison to a lot of the other animals we have in the area and they are a mixed feeder so they feed on grasses as well as trees and at this time of year the getting is very difficult we are expecting the rains it is very windy very blustery there are rains on the way but who knows when they will fall who knows when they will um, sparkle up the grass and make it greener so in the meantime the impala are set to feed off of the nutrient rich grasses that are growing off of the termite mound Cat, you want to know how big of a kill? Well, an animal about that size, very easily for a female leopard. Well, not very easily. And then some males. There was a male off to the right. I don't know if you can get him there, V. He's a bit bigger. There's a male there. That's about as big as, well, he's about as big as they get. He's a bit small because of the condition this time of year. But that's about 130 odd pounds of, of uh, meat. And quite often leopards will hoist them. We call that hoisting, take them up the tree. Sometimes the animal is too big and they feed on it a little bit on the ground before taking it up the tree. It can have anywhere between maybe four and about eight pounds of, feet of, of meat in their belly before they do so, which eliminates the weight slightly. Um, but that is to protect it from marauding hyena and lion and other things that might be looking for them on the ground. But let's go and see if we can find this leopard for you. We left him not a short, not too long ago, and I'm sure he is in the very same place because when it's windy like this and hot like this he's not going to go anywhere he's going to sit there close to the watering hole and wait for the animals to come to him sounds like a very good strategy doesn't it yes it is a very clever strategy very energy conserving strategy
So we are out in the African wilderness. You can see around us is just, it's basically the savannah biome. Uh, we're going to be jumping between myself and another gentleman all the way up in Kenya in the Masai Mara, where it is also the savannah, but due to human influence, doesn't quite look the same as it do does down here. And also a lot to do with the soil. Uh, a lot of volcanic ash, a lot of volcanic rock up there makes it very nutrient rich. And that's why you have animals there all the time doing their thing. Whereas down here, we heavily rely on rainfall. The Mara gets a little bit more rainfall than we do throughout the year. We are very seasonal, very summer rainfall. And those of you in the Northern Hemisphere will be coming out of your summer into your, your winter. So your fall now, I think it's called. We are the opposite. We are going into the, the warm part of the African savanna time, which is when the animals really do struggle. This period now, between now and the first rains when the vegetation sprouts its new leaves and and sprouts its fresh leaves of the grass the animals are really really struggling to do their thing well we're going to come around the corner here see if we can find that male leopard as promised in the meantime my good friend taylor's on drive and she'd like to say good afternoon hello hello and welcome again well, to all of you who have just joined us, I'm going in reverse. Also, my name is Taylor, and on camera with me today is Senzo. Now, I just heard a bird alarming. So it was going, quack, quack, quack. But I don't know what it's alarming at. Now I can't see anything. I thought maybe there was like a leopard or something at the watering hole, but that does not seem to be the case. Okay, well, we're going to be... Oh, there's something cool for you to look at. Are you going to land? Thank you very much, Hornbill. Thank you. This is one of the most comical birds out here that you can see on safari. This is a yellow-billed hornbill. And isn't it quite spectacular? I bet some of you have never ever seen a bird that looks anything like this. Maybe on a cereal box. And that would have been a toucan. But uh, even though they've got rather large beaks like the toucan, I don't think they're related actually at all. How beautiful is that though? trying to balance with all the wind at the moment. This time of the year is very, very, very windy. Mia, I, the, the animal that I think guides think is the most interesting on safari is guide dependent, I suppose, from person to person. I particularly like frogs, just amphibians in general, but uh, you might find some other guides that uh, are repulsed by frogs. So um, it really depends on who's taking you on safari and who you're talking to. I really like elephants, absolutely love elephants, and I think that I can, you can watch them for hours and hours and, and not get bored. Their interactions amongst one another, it's pretty amazing. So, um, so yeah, it's, um, you know, there's, there's lots of different in, or interesting aspects out here. So I suppose it just it depends on what tickles your fancy, if you will. Now Steve was going to Chitwa Dam, but I'm not sure he's going he's going elsewhere now. So we're going to go to Chitwa Dam because it's really, really amazing. Although I don't know what we're going to see down there with it being so windy. I was just saying to all our regular viewers that the animals don't enjoy the wind very much. And with it blowing around like this, typically everything is going to try and hide away and down in the drainage line, so these sort of low-lying areas that are densely um, packed with trees, just to provide a bit of shelter from the wind. <clears throat> but also it's super, super hot today, so animals are going to need to quench their thirst. And there isn't very much water around, there's only a few sort of designated areas. And Chitwa Dam is the biggest man-made dam in the Sabi Sands, so that's this wilderness area that we're in at the moment. And it's about 130,000 acres of land give or take a little bit so it's a huge huge area and there's a good population of hippos down there some cool birds like African fish eagles which look very much like the bald eagle uh, we could see kingfishers we might even see ourselves a crocodile and then what I'm really hoping for which I hope for every single day is a herd of elephants to come down and drink and maybe even swim too so that's what we are planning for Jordan, now you've asked if any of the animals in the park are fed by people. No, 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 not even a little bit, none. These animals are all completely wild. And um, yeah, we don't <clears throat> encourage people feeding them and it's, it's frowned upon. You, you'd get yourself in a lot of trouble if you were caught. <clears throat> Excuse me, I had a tickle in my throat. 
maybe you were caught feeding the animals but that doesn't mean that the animals don't try and steal food from you the vervet monkeys the baboons the hyenas they all come in and try and raid camp and sometimes they're successful so they help themselves <laughs> and so you got to be quite careful about where you leave rubbish bins if you're leaving kitchen doors open i mean even honey badgers will go on in and um, pretty much just help themselves to whatever they want so they have to you have to be quite careful about that okay i think we'll just carry on and get to chitwa dam is just down over there and i was there earlier today and i saw wildebeest they might still be around in some water back too so a nice variety of things anyway steve is on his way towards hosana so let's jump back on board with him and enjoy the ride Well, we are going to try and find him. He moved because of some animals alarm calling. Uh, we had a vehicle that stayed with him for a little while, and then animals were alarm calling. Parlors were... <laughs> and so he moved a little bit more towards this side. So we're just trying to see if we can find him. He's probably lying down in the shade. His name is Osana. He's a two-and-a-half-year-old leopard, a few months over a half at the moment. I'm trying to... February. This is his birthday, so yeah, he's he's getting there. Already, already September. I can't believe it. But he's a beautiful young leopard. I'd love to show him to you. He's a very successful young hunter, and uh, he spent a lot of time on our property, on our reserve in the last two months, which has been fantastic. But I don't know where he's moved to. That is the thing. Leopards, when they disappear, they can disappear. He didn't move far away. He started moving towards some alarm calls, as I said. Um, the vehicle that was with him followed them and then moved off as well to follow up on the alarm calls and then left him somewhere around here. So we're going to see if we can find him for you. Bear with us. This is what happens out here. We spend, we spend a lot of time searching. Not as much time as <laughs> sometimes finding. Okay, so there's some more in parlor there off to the right they might be our help in finding him sorry Lou I didn't quite copy that if you could repeat that for me please beautiful impala hello Mandy you want to know what I'm most afraid of out in the wilderness well I'm not really you don't get afraid out here it's it's you harness your fear I mean there's things that we are fearful of but I'm not afraid of them um, the, the wilderness is a dangerous place. It's an unpredictable place, but if you play by the rules and you respect it, well, then everything should be fine. When we're in a vehicle, you need to understand animal behavior. Elephants can potentially be potentially dangerous if you don't understand them and you get them in their wrong mood in the wrong time of day and you get too close to them. If you don't understand all the telltale signs that they show you long before they react, well, then you're not paying attention. That's something that we spend a lot of time doing and practicing. So nothing to do with um, elephants. I'm not afraid of them. Uh, hippos out the water can be quite daunting. Here we have another vehicle. They're coming to help us find this male leopard. I'm just going to have a quick chat with him, if you don't mind. Hello, Orbs. Hello, everyone. Okay, well, it seems like my friend up in the Masai Mara has found something very special for you. We're going to go all the way up to Kenya with a very good friend, David Gitu. They've been having some difficulties with their, with, I think it was rain actually, it had a thunderstorm. So let's go to him. Don't worry. Hello, boys well, it's and a very warm welcome. We are now in Kenya. Alia, you're watching some beautiful animals in South Africa. But now we're in Kenya in a game reserve called Masai Mara. We apologize. There is a vehicle right there. But when you, what you see at the bottom on the right of your screen, I don't know whether you can hear that, boys and girls. That is a lioness, and to the left we got some zebras running. I do not know why those zebras are running. 
and yes and that was a, a lion roaring ooh, ooh, ooh. so she just stood up because she saw those zebras running so let's just watch and see where that lioness is going sorry about having the vehicle on the way so boys and girls there's something very important i request you to do please through your teachers ask us any questions you may have or if you'll have any nice comment to make please send it through and your teachers know how to do that so that lioness you see walking there that's the lioness and a lioness means it is a female there's a difference between males and females if you're lucky to see a male the males have lots of fur or hair on their neck and the head the girls just like some of you girls in class do not have any fur or hair on your neck isn't this very exciting to watch this so what you want to do we want to show you all the animals we have here so we're just sitting very close to a river and this river is called the Mara River just like the game reserve I told you that is called the Mara game reserve or the Mara triangle and many times you've seen animals coming to cross the river be they wildebeest or zebras today we have been crossing fingers to see zebras if they are going to cross we've been here for quite some time and when that happens we have seen or noticed lions will try and catch them but Jesse, thank you very much. You're the very first person to ask me a question. Thank you, thank you. You're such a good student. Now, what you can show you there, we're showing you some hippos in that already, in, uh, in the water there. But now, in the background there, we only got two lions or two lionesses. And this particular pride of lions, it's called the Paradise Pride very good James apparently James is my cameraman and you can see the one lioness we saw walking earlier it's walking towards another lioness that is not very far from there so at the moment Jesse we got two lionesses and they belong to a pride that we call the paradise pride apparently we have been living with these lions for so very many years we know them by face and we can tell you from one pride to another a pride means a group of lions so if it's females and young ones we'll say a pride but when you see males you'll see a coalition now we'll take you back to the water in the river oh very good james so apart from the vehicles that you see there we apologize for that but boys and girls see how beautiful that lioness is there i think it just came out for you for you to see something different and if you look carefully the tail seems to be cut it has lost a part of the tail not sure we're gonna give this lioness a new name and call it the short tail but if you look at it carefully part of the tail is missing Hopefully it doesn't go below that car because those guests, they will be very scared. And there's so many reasons why lions could have like half a tail. Maybe it was born like that. Maybe it was cut by something. Or maybe it had an infection and that bit came out. There's so many reasons why that tail is not complete. She's just walking majestically, and I think she's going or she's walking to join the other lioness. We want to try and see now if we go to the river whether we can see the hippos that we saw before. Let me see if James, at least we can see the head of them. What we have is just the heads of them. Alicia, lions are heavy, males are much heavier than females but that particular one we saw there i would give it to be about 200 kilograms 200 kilograms which would be about 450 pounds alicia i would say it's about 450 pounds and that weight cannot be compared to the hippos that you see in there the hippos live in water and some of them are so heavy they're almost 
3,000 pounds in weight. So you would imagine 450 pounds of weight from that lioness Alicia. But now looking at the hippos you see there, some of them are over 3,000 pounds in weight. Hippos will always live in the water because unlike other mammals that can regulate their body temperatures outside the water, hippos need to stay in the water to cool off. If they're outside the water for a very long time, they'll die or the sunburn will just kill them. Please don't forget to ask us questions or if you have any comments and you go, wow, that current of water is very fast in that river. So remember I told you this river, it's called the Mara River. I said we're in a country called Kenya and the river you see there, it's flowing from Kenya and it goes all the way to another country called Tanzania. And I'm sure your teachers will show you the map of East Africa. And then the water you see here one day, it will go to a big lake called Lake Victoria. Now we have shown you zebras, we have shown you a lioness, lions, cheetahs and cats are what we call predators and now I'll take you all the way to South Africa for you to see another predator. Thank you, David. I'm so excited that you're having some thunderstorms up there, which no doubt are cooling down the environment. We could do with some in the wind that we feel around us is definitely what brings in the thunderstorms but as promised look at what we have found for you a beautiful young male leopard by the name of Hosanna the little chief his dad is the Duke who is the reigning sort of Duke of the area Tingana and there's a very good chance that Hosanna will be moving off in the next little while as his dad sort of loses his territory like no one can put a time frame of that it's been kind of a running thing for the last six months already eight months or so that I've been here uh, and then he'll move off as soon as a new male moves into the area. The young male will always move away because he's competition for a new male. And you can see him breathing heavily because of the heat. And he is a very efficient hunter, as I said. I've just got back from leave. so my first drive back, but he's been making all sorts of catches and kills over the last little while. Playing with his food even. He's been had so much. Impala up the tree, Nyala's by the pan. All sorts of things. There we go. Look at those teeth. Mm. It's not a toy. It's a real deal right there. Those canines that you saw are what suffocate the prey. It feels like he's going to move. He's going to move. Quite often these cats, lions included, after yawn will move, but uh, not, not now. Hello Alicia, you want to know when you'll be fully grown? Well, generally from the age of three and a half to four, you start seeing males come into sort of sexual maturity. But anywhere from four to five, six is kind of when they're at their peak. Uh, anywhere after that, and they basically just plateau off. They don't really peak anymore. But before that, I mean, he's only two, two years and eight months or nine months now, somewhere around there, ten months. So he's approaching his third year and he's definitely still got a lot of filling out to do when you compare him with his father who is a good 12 years old i think he's in his 13th year there's an enormous size difference so when it comes to competing it's all about size a lot of what leopards do in the natural world is just avoid confrontation by looking bigger than the other one or sounding bigger and Hosan at the moment is just sort of flying under the radar so to speak uh, before i went away he was providing food for his dad who kept stealing from him, very cheeky, but without too much confrontation. Just a bit of a growl and then son hands over pr food to dad. Very interesting behavior to be witnessing. But in his own right, he is very efficient at hunting. And now he just needs to get a little bit more bulk, a little bit more brawn to be able to compete with other big males. He's still got some grain to do there. You can see his back foot, beautiful back foot. And the beautiful rosettes and spots that make them so difficult to find. We were quite lucky. We basically just drove along the road, saw where a vehicle had stopped a, lo a little while before, and then just drove in off-road about 10 meters, and then we had him lying up on the eastern side of the tree because of the shade. And it's the only shade at the moment. There's hardly any leaves on the trees here in the savannah at the moment. We are in the death 
of winter and we are waiting for a little bit of spring rainfall and you'll see everything is going to just bloom out into its abundance but um, I'm not quite sure what Lou said there but we're going to go back over to Taylor Look at what we have found We have found the smallest antelope you can well you can see out here in the Sabi sand and it is a little steenbok Isn't it cute? Now that's actually a fully grown male steenbok and he's just nibbling on whatever he can find They eat a little bit of everything, they eat grass, they eat leaves they'll dig for little bulbs underground and so luckily for them they've got quite a varied diet which makes them one of the antelope that do fairly well in the winter months so we're not in winter anymore but we're in spring but it becomes exceptionally dry as you can see and we're waiting for the rain normally we would have had a bit of a drizzle by now uh, in september normally end of august beginning of september a little downpour but we haven't really had much at all so we'll have to wait for the bigger rain that should come in about october november and then this place will become just basically lots and lots of green grass and green leaves everywhere now it's very vulnerable for this little one to be out like this because not only does it have to worry about hyenas, leopards, lions you know trying to go after it or even a cheetah this is a good area for cheetah it also has to worry about raptors, about birds so big eagles like martial eagles would find it quite easy see as I said the word martial eagle it went what? where? over here? no I promise I didn't see one but they'll fly down at a great speed and actually dive straight into that small antelope in basically in killing it almost instantly but he's stopping because he can't hear very well or smell very well with all the wind blowing around he's gonna have to rely on his eyes and do a lot of stopping searching looking around luckily for the Stienbok the grass is so short there's almost nothing to hide behind so it should be able to see anything coming for it Jesse um I haven't exactly had any animals try and enter my my Jeep while I've been in it um, they typically will ignore us sometimes the lions and leopards come up to the cars and they smell and the elephants too I've had wild dog puppies run underneath my vehicle before and it's not uncommon for the big cats to lay in the shade of your car but that's kind of where it stops um, you don't want any of the animals to touch your vehicle or you know get inside with you it could be a huge problem because as we discussed they're completely wild um, they're not tame whatsoever but they've become quite used to our cars so they become habituated around the vehicles however with saying that if you leave your vehicle unattended and you have food and things inside of it well good luck the monkeys will come in and just have a look through all your things and find all sorts of tasty treats and leave you little pr presents in the form of feces all over your car which is a great smell <laughs> Yeah, it's not. That's not fun. Little chocolate bombs, um, that sometimes are really hard to hose off too. <laughs> Trust me, I've tried. Okay, let's carry on. Our Stenbok is playing hide and seek behind the marula tree now. But thank you, little Stenbok. Be safe. Remember to look up. <laughs> it must be tough to be such a small animal in 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 a big bad world. It's not really a big bad world. Riley, if there is a life-threatening emergency with a human, yes, I would intervene. With an animal? No, unfortunately, well, I, I kind of agree with it. We try not to inter interfere. We as humans always poke our fingers uh, into everybody else's business. We're very nosy by nature and we want to save the world all the time even though we're the ones that are destroying it anyway so now with the wildlife this is what we call an open ecosystem so there aren't any fences around this area the animals can move around freely so the only time we intervene and we will help an animal is if it is injured because of human interference so for an, exa for an example I'm sure you've all read the news and seen um, um, or seen something about poaching I mean you get a variety of different types of poaching people poach elephants they poach lions tigers people are killing whales culling whales and all sorts of 
crazy things anyways there's even small types of poaching where people are just illegally hunting animals for food so like for instance that's steenbok or a bushbuck or a waterbuck or a kudu to eat but they're not allowed to do it they're doing it in protected areas and um, sometimes when these people go and do poaching they'll leave wire snares to try and catch their prey and those can get caught around many different animals we see lots of elephants that have lost their trunks lions wild dogs uh, hyenas, everything has been seen in this greater Kruger area with snares area. We'll have to call um, the vets and notify the conservation teams that we've seen an animal with a snare and the only reason that animal got a snare was because of humans. Or if an animal is poached, it's shot with a rifle and it's still alive, we'll try and intervene and try and, and, and sort of save it. Um, if there is a, an outbreak, like a disease like rabies that has been brought in by a domestic dog, because lots of domestic dogs end up in here just from running around, um, and, and again, poachers also use dogs when they're hunting the smaller prey, like the antelope species I was telling you about. So, uh, so there's, there's different reasons when we do inter intervene, but we typically try and, and, and keep away with it and let nature take its, its course. If we start intervening and saving every lion that's had a fight and has now got a limpy leg, or the same thing goes with a, with a, uh, a leopard, we... You allowing the strongest genetics to survive and that's exactly what well, you know nature wants is it only wants the fittest to be able to make it out um, alive so we start polluting the, well, the, the wildlife systems with weaker genetics that normally wouldn't have had a uh, you know a second chance at life we are coming to up to a bit of a construction site the the landowner here at Chitwa Chitwa he's building himself his new house so that's all going on just in there but we're just going to sneak past it very excited to see what it looks like when it's done I think it's going to be beautiful now we're going to head to the well to the dam right off you go back to Steve to see if Hosanna has well woken up and uh, any of those wonderful things Yes, well, watering holes are definitely the place to search for animals. It brings them in. Um, and we had reports of some buffalo making their way in from the north towards the very same watering hole that that male leopard was hanging around. So we're going to go see if we can quickly catch up with them. Buffalo are one of the largest animals you find out here. Not the biggest, but one of the largest. Definitely in the sort of the, the ruminant sort of category, the animals that eat and chew their cud. So they're like a really big cow, in fact. Oh, sorry, I was not paying attention there. Really big cow, they can weigh up to 2,000 pounds. They are quite formidable, and that is one of the animals that if you are out in wilderness, on foot especially, that you have to be particularly careful of. A buffalo, when they're in a large herd, they're pretty okay. They're generally quite spooky and they run, but when they're on their own, they don't run. And they don't have many eyes or ears when they're on their own, and they're quite grumpy. Generally, old bulls. Uh, they generally get chased and caught by lions, so they don't run. And they can often be quite territorial, not territorial, but aggressive towards people. Uh, a good friend of mine was actually hit by a buffalo a few months ago, and very, very luckily, she's okay. Obviously, many broken ribs and perforated lung is is okay for being attacked by a buffalo so yes you've got to be very careful and they've, they've come and moving through this area here so we're going to see if we can pick it's nice to see buffalo because the buffalo generally bring the lions the lions are very specialized in this area for hunting buffalo they like big animals uh, they provide a lot more meat and then in parlor we started the ship not a huge amount of meat for a pride of 11, 12 lions. You need an animal of 2,000 kilograms of meat to really, really fill your belly. Just keep scanning. They're not the hardest animals to track, I'll be honest with you. They are a moving conveyor belt of dung and tracks. So them it's generally a huge pile like this is not this is not fresh buffalo in the road here but you can see there's a few patties there pats of buffalo dung as they've been coming in and out here they come 
on the way, a little bit further up, just black masses moving through the long grass. I believe it's a breeding herd of buffalo, which means that uh, there are babies in amongst it with uh, mature adult bulls that are breeding. And then obviously the, the females that go in and, and about and do all of that as well. So let's get a nice position here. There we go. A question there, Lou. I didn't quite copy the name, but are buffalo more dangerous than hippo? Well, that's a very good question. Riley, you want to know if buffalo are more dangerous than hippo? Well, they're a very different animal, and in different situations, I think they're equally as dangerous. Um, what we're looking at here, there in the front of the screen, is you can see two young males. There's a third young male. These are breeding males, and there's a female. Okay, so you need to be able to identify those. The female doesn't have a very big boss on the front of her head. You see it's not too many ha uh, it's hair there. It's not a solid bone. I'll get back to the hippo question in a moment. So that will indicate to you that this is a breeding herd. Um, there's females in it. They'll probably find some babies, but they'll be in the, in the mix in between the herd somewhere. And then you get these guys. You can see how much more pronounced the horn is on the top there, the boss. As they get older, that boss gets bigger and bigger and starts to split. There he goes, licking his lips. Very, very tasty. And when you find buffalo bulls on their own, they can be extremely dangerous. Potentially dangerous is the preferred term. Um, and if you do get in their way, um, they can potentially mow you down. And at 2,000 pounds, well, you don't really have any match for them with their big horns and their very heavy hooves. And if they're not very happy, well, they're, no, they're known to, to sort of to horn you on the ground. And, well, not many people do very well after that. Whereas a hippopotamus either runs a person over because they're between them and the water or someone is in the water swimming or on a canoe and the hippo just bites you in half. There's not much you can do about being bitten in half by an animal that can weigh up to 4,000 pounds. So the weight is extremely, well, a lot bigger in, uh, in hippo, of course. But uh, a hippopotamus that you come across that is out the water or in water that can't completely submerge its body, well, you must be very careful, regardless of whether you're on foot or in a vehicle, that animal can become very dangerous due to the fact that it's very, very uncomfortable. Um, a buffalo in a herd like this, they're quite relaxed because they've got their their fellows they got their friends so I wouldn't regard them as being extremely dangerous but they still fall under the potentially dangerous category and um, we do log them and we do need to, need to train to be able to approach them on foot and you need to understand what to do in a vehicle as well but they don't see the vehicle as a threat obviously you don't want to park in their way if they're headed on a game path let them pass sometimes it's the nicest thing in the world to to in the middle of the night you can hear the buffalo coming like they're doing right now stop your car they end up surrounding the car very characteristic sounds come from a buffalo herd which are normally heard but it's quite windy at the moment so we're not really hearing anything but just that and you can be surrounded by it and i don't know if any of you have ever milked a cow or enjoy cows or anything like that. My grandfather used to milk cattle and I loved waking up in the morning milking his cows. So buffalo, when they surround you, you get that really, really bovine smell of the dung and just them, their, their, their bodies in general are pretty, pretty cow-like. So they smell very similar uh, and I just love it. I love it. So at night, it can be quite awe-inspiring to be surrounded by a herd of buffalo and to just have them doing their thing around you. They're not out to get you, they are herbivores. So is the hippo, they feed on grass. The buffalo needs to drink water twice a day. So um, VM was telling me that, VM was telling me that they um, were drinking down this morning. Now they're coming back again in the afternoon. So I think we're going to be going back over to David up in the Masamara, who's got an animal that looks similar to this buffalo, but just slightly, slightly different. Thank you very much, Steve. All the way in South Africa. Boys, you can imagine what we are able to bring to you from Africa. And I'm sure at one point after the show, you look or your teacher will show you the map of Africa and look where South Africa is and where Kenya is. Now, Steve was showing you some bigger animals than what we have here, buffaloes. Now, I got a little smaller animals, but very interesting animals to talk about. And we call these animals wildebeest or wildebeest. 
Remember, as I said earlier, if you have any questions or any comments, please, through your teachers, send them to us. And we have always made a joke and said this wildebeest don't have a proper name like a buffalo, a zebra, a hippo, a giraffe. You know, it's an interesting name, a wild beast, wild, because you look at them carefully. They look like it's a combination of different animals of Africa. The head or the horns look like of a buffalo that Steve was just showing you. If you look carefully on the neck, I'm sure James is going to show you the neck. You see there, it seems like it has some like stripes of a kind that would relate to a zebra. Look at the tail. And I'm sure James is going to show you a tail. It's like a tail of a horse. And if you look on the legs, the legs look for like an antelope. And James, I'm sure, will try and get one that is facing as you look on the face. And the faces of these animals look like locusts, like that one there. You'll see its face look like a locust. If James, you go back to the right a little bit, or there, that one there, if you, yeah, that one, just look on the face on that one. See, it look like a locust. So like a combination of all different animals. Now, when we say or we talk of migration, these are the animals that are very famous all over the world when it comes to migration. Aaron, the rarest animal I would see here in the Maasai Mara or the Mara Triangle, I would say it's either a pangolin or an advac. A pangolin or an advac. Because these two species of animals normally come out at night and it's very difficult to see them during the day. And even at night, you have to work very hard to see them. They are there. But for example, an advac has a very sensitive skin, so it cannot be out in the sun during the day. Pangolin would come out, and once in a while we see them, but it's always sheer luck. And Aaron, we normally say here in Africa, when you see a pangolin, and especially during the day, that means good luck. So the wildebeest, I was talking about them doing what we call migration, and migration is when the animals move from one place to another. So this wildebeest will move from a country called Tanzania in a national park called Serengeti, and they'll come to my country, Kenya, in the game reserve we are in called the Mara Triangle. And they travel for thousands and thousands of miles. And mainly they move because of what you see them doing, grass, food, that's what makes them move from one area to the other. So where they came from, they must have eaten all the grass that was there. So if you look here, the grass is tall, and that's why they're here, eating the grass. But after a few months, they'll be moving further south, back to Tanzania, and they'll be going to the national park I was talking about called Serengeti. And there, that's where they give birth. So. When they're dropping their babies, that will be the second reason why they'll have to move. So two main reasons why these animals will move. As I said earlier, they'll always move because of food and number two, because of giving birth to their young ones. Now, as wildebeest migrate from one area to another, I'm also going to migrate from here to the other girl in South Africa. Yes, I am the other girl in South Africa, and that is a hippo that had birds on its head. Let's see if anyone is going to be brave enough to land back on its head. I don't think so, though. Anyway, those birds were called oxpeckers, and they were just using that hippopotamus as a rock to get closer to the water. Isn't that clever? I wish I could do that. Anyways, the hippos are very lazy today, and there's the nostrils of another one. There's quite a few of them in this big dam, and we find this big dam. At Chitwa Chitwa, which I said to you is the largest man made dam in this wilderness area. See, look how huge it is. Massive now, because I was telling you we haven't had any rain. So look at all of them. 
not look at all of them, look at all that water. I wouldn't be brave enough to swim across there because if you look a little bit further back, there's actually a crocodile on one of the islands, very far away. But you can have a quick little glimpse of it. David would have had a better opportunity at showing you um, crocodiles. And there's also some Egyptian geese just sitting there, which don't mind the crocodiles too much. To be honest, I don't think that crocodile is interested at the moment in catching a Egyptian goose. I think it is just taking this opportunity to warm itself up on the banks. And also, who would mess with an Egyptian goose if it was sitting with its crocodile guard dog? I think that's very, very clever on the geese side. But as you can still hear, it is howling in absolute gale force wind at the moment. It's not very nice. And I've noticed that not all the hippos are out and about today, and I think it's because of the wind. John, no, I don't know if anybody could ever get tired of going on safari because you can see lots of different things all the time. Sometimes you are tired when you are on safari because we wake up really, really early. So at the moment, most of us are waking up between quarter past four and half past four, half past four in the morning. Can you imagine getting up that early? Crazy, right? So we do that for lots and lots of days. And we work very, very long cycles, so we don't have weekends off and public holidays and things like that. We have, uh, we work about four to six weeks. So no, not four, not, that's a, a nonsense. We, walk, we work about six to ten weeks, actually. And then we get about two weeks off or sometimes a little bit longer to go on holiday. So it's a pretty cool job. You get to come out on safari all day long, watch these wonderful animals. Sometimes you have to entertain people and take them on safari and show them the nice things. You have to wake up very early and you work very long days. If you're a, a typical safari guide that works at a commercial lodge, sometimes you can find yourself working 14 to 16 hours every single day. But you get used to it and it is such a cool career to get into uh, while, you are, while you're nice and young. And you can see that hippo is fast asleep. They have it easy out here. They don't have to wake up at 4.30 in the morning. That's the time that they're going to bed. But anyways, thank you for all of you who have joined us from the schools today. It's been absolutely amazing and I hope you've learned a little bit or at least laughed and smiled. That's the goal. And we, we hope that you join us again next time. So thank you for all the questions. And I believe it was your first time with us and we hope to see you again. But uh, from all of us here at Wild Earth, thank you very much and we'll see you all next time. Hello back and welcome back everybody. We are still with our buffalo herd and in for the sake of Jamie I'm going to say we are we've just previously ensconced in this herd of buffalo that has moved either side of our vehicle. It has been quite something to behold. I just now they're finally making a noise. I'm so surprised. I was saying it before that they always make these noises and I just heard the first one there. VM's also quite surprised. I can't believe how quiet they are. You can hear the ox peckers are calling on their backs. We found a few. Let's see if we can find them again. But there were a few pairs of yellow billed ox peckers. Uh, yeah, there might be some lions around. Louise reckons she saw some lions this morning somewhere around this area. No doubt they'll be following these lions. There we go. There's the ox peckers hitching a ride. You can see the yellow. They're called yellow billed because, oh, that buffalo's having a bit of a gallop. Uh oh little bit of herd turmoil going on right there so that beak was half red and half yellow the red bill ox picker which is that much more common of the two has got a fully red beak very special to see the yellow bill ox pickers have been on the decline for many many years it's one of the so sort of the real sort of winning strategies or should I say um, uh, what's the right word successful stories from the endangered wildlife trust the reintroduction of the yellow billed ox picker from Botswana um, their demise was obviously due to the facts of many pesticides being used and cattle being dipped for ticks and the oxpecker, the yellow build being almost a, spe almost a specialized bovine um, oxpecker and obviously it didn't kill the adults themselves but it decreased the lining of the egg when they laid it so the eggshell was quite soft and so when the parents went to incubate it they just crushed them so it's a very sad story of what we've done but we are bringing them back I'm going to turn around see if we can get a nicer view of them but they are headed directly towards Horsana who 
some of you out there, I'm sure a lot of you out there will know a little bit of a thing for buffalo. Not long ago, he was actually chasing a herd that actually encouraged Taylor into a sighting that Scott had on foot and thinking it was lions, because who else chases buffalo other than lions? Well, Hosanna does. And that is because we have found him once before on a buffalo carcass. Quite commonly poached from other predators. Got a nice one of those ox pickers right here, V. Two of them just looking at us on this female. There we go. Now, very, very hot. That is a term called gala fluttering, where birds open the beaks. Because um, once again, back to the thermal camera, we spent a lot of time looking at animals with a thermal camera. And when you looked at birds, their body was very well insulated against the cold, but then also of, of letting off heat. So the only way they can let off heat is to open their mouth and let the wind flow over their beaks. Um, some animals will even go stand in the water, something very commonly seen with martial eagle. I saw the fish eagle doing it recently. And some of them will also have a little bit of a bath. So they are definitely heading down towards some water. So we're going to try and figure it exactly. Rosalind, are Cape Buffalo endangered? No, not at all. There, there's two different types, we could say, of Cape Buffalo in South Africa at the moment. You get the diseased buffalo, which is this one, the naturally occurring Kruger Park buffalo. And then there's a corridor quite a few kilometers west of us that no buffalo or many wildlife are allowed to cross and on the other side of that corridor people have been breeding and all over South Africa people have been breeding buffalo that are free of TB uh, free of corridor disease other diseases that might have been transferred as well and the buffalo is a natural carrier of TB uh, there are plenty of them in the Kruger National Park really really are I couldn't tell you offhand how many but number of herds really had no problem with their numbers throughout Africa I don't think uh, there's no real need for for poaching I mean the meat obviously there might be a little bit of poaching done because of meat but from an endangered point of view there are many many buffalo I mean this herd I reckon was plus 50 what do you reckon V? Maybe, maybe more 60 even buffalo hard to say but by no means endangered um, but you know, habitat is very, very important for them. They require water twice a day and they need long, good grazing. So they're nomadic in that. They move in response to that. And um, if anything, the lions pick them off one at a time. But by no means does it make too much of a dent in their population. That, that arms race, the lions get stronger and the buffalo get stronger. That kind of battle that's constantly raging through the, the eras of history. There's a little youngster born in December, January time. They're all quite young. Most of the buffalo are born in the middle of the summer when the grazing is the best to provide the to provide the female with the best nutrition with regards to milk and all that sort of thing. And obviously we're going to follow them around to go and see where exactly they drink. Looks like Gallego, but we're going to go up to David in the Mara and hopefully we'll find some lions, but I'm pretty sure he has already found some. Let's go to Dave. Well, we moved away from the wildebeest and we have found another pride of lions and this particular pride is called the Mugoro pride, Mugoro, and there are always three girls, but currently we got two just moving in that tall grass, boom, typical of lions. There's another one right behind it, we cannot see it very well now, but there were two and this pride normally consists of three females where they just lay down not far from there there's an impala about 50 meters 40 meters from there but we can't see it very well from where we are but i highly doubt they would go for it an impala is too small for such big cats operators to burn their energy so i do not know why they're trying to get close to that impala and the other you know choices of prey that go for wildebeest that we we're just watching a few minutes ago or even zebras so we may have to reposition or move forward a little bit they're just now right flat in the grass we can't see anything and james is doing all he can to see whether we can relocate them again but it looks that it is now just laying in that grass right there so two females and this is part of the Mogoro pride. 
So around there and on the other side of that tall grass is where the impala is. But of course that grass is much taller than the impala. So we can see either, we can see the lions or the lionesses, neither can we see the impala. So what I may try to do maybe now is just to move forward and see if you're lucky we might see something different. But I was thinking they were edging much closer to that impala, but I highly doubt they would even bother to hunt it. If the impala would come so close to them, they can take a chance. But saying giving a chase, how they give chases to other prey like zebras or wildebeest, I highly doubt that would happen. And they know that. They don't want to burn so much of the, of the kilo calories for some small little prey, and more often than not, they know they don't do very well when going for a hunt. So we'll just move forward and see what could be laying ahead of us. All right. Jim's good to go? Okay. Or maybe if we change the location or the position, we might see something different. Let's see. Who knows? We might go in past a vehicle here. We're also enjoying the lions uh, like us. So now this could be different because you can see them watching. James, let me know what angle you want or tell me to stop. Is that good there? How is that, James? Good? Katie, that's a very good question for your age. And I would say, Katie, the only way you tell the mother lioness is by looking at the size the lionesses or the mothers like what we have here if there would be cubs here we could these ones could qualify to be mothers because they are already fully grown so katie the only way you can tell the mothers if we are lucky to maybe to see cubs you could see maybe the cubs nursing or suckling or drinking milk from the mothers that's the only way you could tell which the mothers are but in general the mothers are fully grown and big in size. These two here qualify to be mothers if they had any cubs. These are fully grown lionesses. And you notice they blend in very well in the grass where they are. And the direction she is looking is where we have that impala. Not sure, again, as I said, she would even bother going for the impala. But again, when they lay down there, you see one of them just laid flat, looking at the bellies. They don't look very hungry to me. They look to be in very good shape. So the third one is missing in action, but I'm sure she is not very far from here. And when we got here earlier, these two were calling. Kelly, I hope you're still watching and listening to me. That's how exactly they were calling. And the three of these girls, or three of these females, they're fully grown and they normally go together. And I got a feeling they were calling the third one. The tree lane you see there, on the other side of the tree lane, that's the Mara River, or rather that's where we were before. And I think that's where the other one might have, have maybe gone for a drink. Typical for lions just to lay, sleep. We have always had a misconception thinking that it's only males that sleep and people have unfortunately said males are lazy, but that's a way of conserving energy. But even females, if they are very well fed, they have no reason not to sleep. So I have seen females also going 15, 16, 16 hours a day sleeping. So the notion that it's only the male lions that will sleep 15, 20, 22 hours in a day, I don't think it's very true. It applies to all lions across the board, even the females. If you look at the one on the left of your screen, there you can tell she is, you know, comfortable, sleepy. But again, maybe this one particular one is just staying alert and staying awake. Should a zebra come crossing maybe from the Mara River coming to this side, and you look, if you notice, they're very close to that tall grass. And what would happen is any prey that will be walking into this tall grass will just come up in the open of the lionesses. And maybe here, what I would say they're doing is like laying an ambush. And before the prey you know, realizes, the lioness will be on their neck. 
if you look below it, you, below the chin, you can see some like white, something like a beard. It's like some fur or like whiskers, like you see on most cats. You can see James is doing a very good job there. Lioness says, we want you to do something. I wish there's a way, you know, we'd get some prey here. But as we wait to see what you will do, uh, the beautiful girl Taylor has left Chitradam and is on the move now. Stop making me blush and everyone giggle and final control, David, when you say that. <laughs> oh, I don't know where we going. We could be anywhere. No, I'm just joking. We're on the fi I think we're on the fire break at the moment. And we're going to check out Buffalo's Hook Dam. We'll have a little squiz to see what's happening there. I, maybe we will meet Winston, was it? Wingston Churchbill. Maybe. We'll see him again. We'll try. Let's go down this road, Senzel. Yeah, up we go. Um, if you don't know who Wingston Churchbill is, you're just going to have to wait to find out and <laughs> see if he's around at Bifflesook Dam. But I'm sure you can guess that it's not a tortoise, but in fact a bird. Because what? why would you name a tortoise Wingston Churchbill? Anyways, um, so <laughs> it's very quiet, it's very windy. I don't know where all the animals are. Maybe we're going to bump into Tani because we all know I can't track her. I just, sometimes she, she graces me with her presence, otherwise she tries to avoid me at all costs. Although she hasn't been seen by anybody else though, so it kind of makes me feel a little bit better. So she's starting to, it's gonna get quite pleasant now, hey Senzel? The temperature's dropping. I'm hoping the wind drops with it. We will see. We shall see. Still gonna try to find those lions that Louise was talking about. We'll see. Senzo is now cackling. <laughs> Do you find that funny? Do you think Louise had made it up? And it's just it's just some kind of jokes. <laughs> He's laughing at being in the car with James and James not believing that Louise saw anything. So I still believe Louise. Believe Louise! I mean that'd be a great campaign. Um <laughs> so We'll see. We'll, I think we'll check the dam. We might go down in Yala Road, north and south. And then we will also go along Central and then sort of worm our way down towards the, the north and to the west. So I know the Nkuhumas, after they paraded through Juma and um, I have made it to Arethusa safely, thankfully, and they got themselves some dinner. So I wonder if it's not, I don't know, what are the lions we've been seeing? Somebody, somebody. Okay, I see gold water. That's because of the sunlight reflecting on Bufflesook Dam. It's quite pretty. So we shall have a look at the gold now. We're almost there, I promise. Oh, we might find all sorts of things here. Please be elephants playing around in the golden brown murky soup. Ah, oh, Lara Moore, you said, I believe Louise. I feel like that'd be a great little badge. I believe Louise. I believe Louise. That's all gonna get stuck in your head now. It's kind of like when Dexter can only say, what does Dexter say? No, Louise, tell me what Dexter says about the omelet when he can only speak French and he can't get into his laboratory. We're talking about a cartoon now. Omelet du flamage, I forgot. And that's all he can say. That's all you're going to be doing. And be like, I believe Louise. <laughs> I'm going to say it in that voice though. I believe Louise. Okay, let's look for Winston. Winston! Oh no, we haven't got. Yay, hashtag, I believe Louise. Okay, I'm going to stop saying that now. We have a hippo. Hippo, do you believe Louise? We'll see now. If you blink three times, then we know you've said yes. One, two, three. Well done. Thank you very much, Hippopotamus, for joining the campaign. 
Now, people are chanting Scuba Steve, is it? Is it really Scuba Steve? I don't know, I haven't seen Scuba Steve for so long. All I know is this one's got terrapins on its back and terrapins also swimming around it. I actually wish I could be a terrapin. I would hold the world record for, be, for, for being a terrapin firstly and for building the biggest terrapin pyramid. You know, like the cheerleaders do and also doing the biggest bomb drop off of a hippo's back. Why are you all running away? Come back. They're intimidated by me becoming Taylor the Terrapin. <laughs> please can somebody make a post? Please can, please can somebody make a picture of my face on a turtle's body or a Terrapin's body? That'll be my best day ever but scuba steve is just fast asleep as he normally is he doesn't seem to get up to very much at all when he's at bifelzuk dam but you can also see how the water has subsided now thank you for being our water measurer and then shall we look at some of the little birds just on this little floating it's not a floating island i have no idea why i said that there's a little three-banded plover just off to the right just walking on the edge there i do like these little birds pecking away Getting all those little insects. Incredible how it doesn't sink into the mud. If I were to try and do the same thing, I think I'd be waist deep. And Senzel would have to throw the tow rope out and try and rescue me. Although he might leave me in there and drive away. <laughs> I would. <laughs> would you help me? Oh, you're so sweet. I wouldn't. <laughs> but it's, um... But very cool to see those little birds. It's, uh, and I think this little plover is quite happy with the fact that uh, it doesn't have to worry about being chased by Mr. or Mrs. Blacksmith Lapwing because they seem to have vacated the Buffles Hook Dam. Lucky for you. I mean, yesterday we were watching the Blacksmith Lapwing chase the saddle build stalk, which was crazy. I mean, if you think of the size comparison between the two, it's um, pretty enormous on the... Um, saddle build stalk side oh there you sinking a little bit careful i don't know if i'd be able to rescue you i would little plover if you got stuck i'd dive on there and i'd wade on over to get you oh my goodness you're all starting so many hashtags i believe taylor the terrapin louise for president no what was it What was what was the hashtag, Senzo? Believe Louise. I believe Louise. Sorry, I've forgotten already. Oh, and it's the Egyptian geese are there too. Hi, oh, Egyptian geese. That one's having a great old time there. Perhaps it's um, dropped a coin and is trying to find it at the bottom of the dam. <laughs> No, I'm just joking. I'm talking absolute nonsense. It's not. It's feeding at the moment. Could be looking for its lost gosling, says Louise. Louise, that's not funny. Stop immediately. Stop that hashtag. Don't support her after that comment. <laughs> I did. I laugh at everything, though. I totally do. Now. I actually cannot believe how many terrapins are in this dam between that Egyptian goose that's swimming and Scuba Steve right now. Look at all those little heads. Ah, hello Joshua. You are now asked about the difference between a terrapin and a turtle. Well, let me tell you, Joshua. So, Joshua, shall we start at the beginning? Shall we start with the tortoise? A tortoise is a as I almost said a mammal, but it's not a mammal. It's a reptile that lives on land. It carries its house on its back. I'm not talking about a snail either. And um, tortoises, not all tortoises, but there are some that can actually swim fairly well, like the leopard tortoise, for example, which is the largest species of tortoise that we get here in southern Africa. And uh, then they, so they typically go down and drink water, but you don't see them normally swimming around. But it can be confusing when you bring the leopard tortoise into it. Then you get a turtle which in South Africa, a turtle is something that lives out in the ocean and has flippers. So it, it, it doesn't have any toes, it doesn't have any claws, and it swims really well, and it has a lovely shell, and they can't retract their head all, like, 
all the way in like a tortoise can and put their feet up right in front to try and protect them although they do but they don't do it as well as a, a tortoise can then you get a terrapin which is what we, we call oh yes okay we, the terrapins are these things here and they're sort of like semi-aquatic you see them out on land but they also spend most of their time in the water and they've got partially webbed toes as well as claws but now in the states your version of a terrapin uh, oh no a turtle is our it is our terrapin so essentially they're the same thing so those uh, snapping turtles that you get uh, that would be a snapping terrapin <laughs> yeah and all the terrapins in south africa snap so um yeah you don't want to be bitten by one of those but that's essentially the difference oh hello steve steve has gone i don't like that vehicle that's just arrived i'm going to show you how big i am didn't work though because they're still here didn't chase them away but worth a try anyways they sat back down. I would very much enjoy it if he rolled over. He's now giving them the evil eye. Righty, yo, it seems as though David is having a better day than we are and he's managed to find all sorts of wonderful kitty cats. I wonder if those lions are up and awake and have spotted the impala just yet. Well, yes, just having scuba, Steve in water. I am having different herbivores here out of the water. And these uh, female impalas with their young ones, as much as this one boy. Oops, did you see that jump there? Very happy lambs here. Got three youngsters here and they're full of joy in their life. We call these antelopes impalas, so you're going for head on each other. How playful is that? How sweet? I would say they're full of joy, very happy lambs. Lots of green grass. And I mean, you know, it, it couldn't be better. I don't know what they just got the attention there so look in the same direction their ears are also facing the same side they have learned or they will learn as they grow always to be careful of would-be predators now impalas here in the mara triangle in kenya do not have a marked zero season or breeding season so all around the year we'll see these lambs being dropped i guess that could be the mother but we've got three young ones here and maybe three mothers, but we have a different species of animal there. All right. I'm sure James will come to it. It's in front of those ones there. We'll some more impalas. But as James is going to that one there, this is a bit different. And this is the Thompson gazelle. Thompson gazelle. Sometimes we call them Tommies. And they'll hang out together because they have a commonality. Kimberly, I lost the comms there. Come again, Lou. Sorry, there's a vehicle just moving next to us. Sorry, Lou, there was a comment from Kimberly there, and I'm sure maybe she might have said, what a great view. I'm trying to imagine she's just enjoying this, which I couldn't agree with you, Father Kimberly. Yes, they jump so high because that is one characteristic they need for survival. Impalas sometimes have been known even to jump four meters high or seven meters across, and that one helps them when they're taking off or when they're running away from the predators. So jumping is an important ritual for impalas. That way they're able to escape, Kimberly, from the would-be predators, and more so, I would say, cheaters. Cheetahs, leopards are the predators that will go for this size of antelope, for prey. And they're just out there, beautiful in the Mara Savannah. That's beautiful sky there. And we've got different species there crossing the road. And that one is a topi. Topi, you'd notice, is much bigger in size than the Thompson gazelles. 
and impalas and just how lucky we are just staying in one position three different species just walking or playing very close to where me and James are you look carefully on the hindquarters and notice the different coloration it got unlike the other part of the body hindquarters front quarters more grayish than the other part of the body but what is interesting if you'll see a young one of a topi it looks like a lamb of an impala it doesn't have those two colorations it got so there's a male impala that came in there i don't know where he just came from we didn't see him earlier and then the thompson gazelle is still there enjoying the grass as usual flicking the tails and they tend to go to the very fine grass, the Thompsons or the Tommies. Sorry, Lucina asks, have I ever seen what? Oh, sorry, sorry, Sinak, sorry, sorry, Sinak. In the Mara, we got lots of hartebeest, lots of hartebeest. And Sinak, hartebeest are more or less the same size as the topis. So topis and the sesibes in South Africa and the hartebeest are basically the same size. But like the impala you see there, Sinak, the hartebeest have that color, maybe much lighter. And sometimes we call the hartebeest kongoni. We got lots of them. In the Mara, and maybe if you're lucky, Sinak, we might see one today. But I've seen Hardwits here very many times, and hopefully, we see one. Stay tuned, don't go away, keep watching before we end the show. We might be lucky to see some. Very beautiful camera work there, and that's the Ololol escapement. And anybody who watched the movie Out of Africa, that escapement featured very prominently in that movie out of Africa that brought Kenya in a very special tourist uh, on the tourist map and great sunset there the clouds are, are quite dark at that point and about an hour earlier we had some showers it was spitting rather and then it got heavier we had to bring the flaps of the car down very good job there excellent James we have to move on and uh, keep watching the sun as it goes down I want to go in this direction and I'm thinking now what do I want to look for I'm thinking if I'm lucky maybe look for a cheetah or even a hyena what do you think James do you agree with me James says between hyena and a cheetah he'd be happy to look for a cheetah and that's exactly what I'll be doing if we are lucky to see one and let's find out what Steve is up to well thank you David we've done a little bit of a loopy loop um, the buffalo were initially headed towards Gallego so we thought well seeing as we're at Gallego let's go and see what Hosan is doing and he wasn't doing much so we then decided to go back and see if the buffalo were indeed on their way to Gallego and they then had done a bit of a a turn and they are directly mobile towards what I think we think VM thinks and he's been here a few more days than I have that they're heading straight towards Vuya Taylor watering hole so we did a bit of a loop all the way around the herd to see if maybe we could find some lions following them because that is what we often find and that would have been something quite spectacular to behold uh, maybe we could have beaten David on the lion front this afternoon but that's not going to be the case who knows, it is still early days. It has definitely cooled down a little bit. Maybe the lions would be thinking about it. Maybe they're still slumbering away somewhere. And uh, we'll get up in the next little while to follow these buffalo. Because we know that the lions do like buffalo. I've never seen a proper, in my life, live proper buffalo takedown. So that's something I've been quite excited to see in the winter here with the Uncle Huma pride. I've seen a baby buffalo get killed and I've seen dugger boys that have already been killed. I didn't see the process of it all, but yeah, Lou's saying a buffalo kill with Uncle Humas can always be something quite spectacular to see. 
And through this area here, when you do some walking, you spend time out here, it's amazing how much how many carcasses of buffalo, especially from, I believe, I've been told anyway, whenever we find one, Herbie will tell me the story. Herbie's the, our game scout who helps us with looks very, very talented young individual. And uh, well, as old as me, a little bit older than me, young at heart, both of us, indeed. And always, the, you know, oh, there we go. We just got the tail end of the buffalo coming up now. Sorry, it's a bit bumpy. So they've moved, it's gonna be, um, the lodge on the right hand side, Buyatela or Gallego Lodge. Sorry about the bumps, V. They really aren't as excited about the water as I thought they were. On the radio, they were said that we were told that they were highly mobile. So that's why we are coming all the way in the wrong direction initially. Here now, we go around towards the pan itself. Let's just pop in here quickly and have a little look at them moving. Here they come. Now they're almost out the other side. So we have a quick little look here. And then we go and see how they emerge out the other side. There we go. There's a nice little bit of artistic light for you. Sorry about the angle. MG, you want to see a live buffalo kill, but a buffalo killing a lioness. Is that what I heard, Lou? I've seen that before. It's not fun. Poor lion, but then, hey, poor buffalo. You saw that one as it moved out of shot there. Had a, his haunches are starting to show. There's not too much in the way of good grazing at the moment. The buffalo are having to make do with whatever grass is left to them at the moment. And there's not enormous amounts of nutrients in it. Some of the grasses, including the buffalo grass, do hold nutrients longer than other grasses, but they still are quite dry. And a lot of the nutrients in the roots, they don't have the ability that elephants have to, to rip the roots up and feed on them like that, which is a very good adaptation. These buffalo have to feed on the long grass stalks and stems and leaves. And they don't even crop it down low to the ground like wildebeest do. They generally just feed on the tall, bunchy stuff. Okay, well, there's these last ones try and navigate through the thicket. We're going to go around to the other side here, where the buffalo are already starting to emerge there, and I'm sure only minutes away from having a drink. Um, so it's always quite something to watch. I absolutely love watching buffalo on foot, because what we've done this afternoon is you... You know, if we were walking and we saw these buffalo kind of heading in the direction, then you go and you try and position yourself. I've done it many times with guests. Go position yourself on the other side of a, of a dam or a pan or something that the buffalo are clearly, clearly, okay, well, they're already around the dam camp. So there we go. Minutes until the whole herd is there. But so parking off, and I often put guests sort of in like a nice view position, but with maybe the a tree that they can lean on so when the buffalo eventually emerge out of the thickets or wherever it is that they might be coming from they don't really see the people sitting there because their eyesight's not great if you stand up and you show yourself as a human well very very easy okay well the buffalo are already doing their thing <laughs> all over the damn camp a few minutes too late it might be but we're definitely going to get some of them having a little drink let's just zoom all the way around here and so if, to be on foot and to be experiencing that and have a buffalo come in and kind of not quite sure what's going on with that very sort of buffalo-like look and uh, the wet nostrils and when they finally start drinking the moisture dripping off of the nose really really is quite profound and it's as simple as watching an animal go down and drink it's really there's nothing too much to it if we come in from the top V yeah but there's something about it, it's very special, especially when you get to, to see it on foot and wait for it in anticipation, because as what we've been doing, waiting for them to come through. You wanna start there? Or should we go around? Let's go around, there's some really nice light coming through, because they, they do take their time sometimes. Sometimes they burst out of the thickets, but when you're on foot waiting for them, you end up start losing confidence that they're still coming. But eventually they do, because their intentions are clear. They're going to drink, they're going to eat, whatever it is, it's pretty straightforward. 
And if you know where the watering points are, well, head on over there, you should get yourself a marvelous view, which is exactly what we're about to do. Patrick, um, I don't think Buffalo, Cape Buffalo, have got any inclination to be domesticated. Um, they have been bred for disease-free purposes so that they can be reintroduced into parks, but they are even more dangerous than these guys. So um, if you actually look at the world statistics on cattle, so many people get killed every year by bulls, cattle ranches and the like, that um, big bovids in general are extremely dangerous. So are there ever really domesticated even a normal cattle a normal cow a big bull well, you can never really tame those guys they're extremely dangerous full of testosterone and that is the problem so i don't think there's ever been an attempt to try and domesticate buffalo down here um, we've had oxen and cows that came in obviously with the westerners and um, diseases passed on by buffalo completely wiped out many many of the domestic sort of cattle brought in so i don't know if anyone ever thought let's try and domesticate them all I know is that from the reports and from the, the, the breeding programs, uh, they, they get quite tame and you can get them quite close to the car, uh, but they, they suddenly just be, can become very, very sort of territorial or aggressive and an animal that weighs as much as 2,000 pounds, if it decides it's having a bad day and you're in the way, well, there's not much you can do about it. So there they are, an entire herd of buffalo um, completely converged on the pan and take about 36 liters in in a, in a gulp or in a drink there you go it's starting to make some noise so they've relaxed a bit i might try and move up a little bit more there v if you're happy we'll go if you're watching the dam cam it's a marvelous view of them on there almost as good as ours probably better than ours at the moment so that's just you know giving them space did just rush in there chase them away give them space you know one of the biggest things you've got to realize is that coming to and from the water to drink every day is part and parcel of how they survive and one of the most important ethical things I learned many years ago is never and as a trails guide you fail if um, you chase animals away from the water so if you're on a walk and uh, animals are headed towards the water and you want to get there and you want to see them you will fail your assessment if you chase those animals from the water because that is their bed and bread and butter that's how they survive the day and just for us to have a nice walk and see animals doesn't mean we can influence them and chase them away from their very necessary drink <laughs> v can you see that you're a little bit right there's a youngster with its bum in the air. There we go. A little bit on the right of the screen. Middle. Middle. Directly in the middle. Very brown body. There we go. He's doing a very nice stretch there. His feet are on the on the log. Look at that. That was a very nice yoga stretch if I ever saw one. There we go. He's pulled his head out of the water now. The safest place to be there ensconced in amongst mum and dad and all of aunties and uncles. Beautiful. It's my first time seeing buffalo like this on Juma. So I know we've been talking about it for months. Everyone's been saying, Steve, where are the buffalo? And I've been saying, just wait. They're going to be coming soon. As soon as the grass elsewhere starts to deteriorate. And anyway, let's go back up all the way up to the Maasai Mara. And David Gitu has found a very special bird that likes to hang in around the watering points. Probably not as exciting as these buffalo, but exciting nonetheless. Well, buffaloes are huge animals and uh, we have now moved from the buffaloes to a feathered friend here and we got one of the largest or the largest vulture we have in Africa. And this is the lappet faced vulture. Sometimes we also call them the Nubian vultures. And just look at how majestic he is being up on that torchwood tree. And if you look at her carefully, she got a bare head. Very good camera work, James. Sometimes we call these trees the balanite. And you can see a lot of very thick clouds in the background there. And I'm very convinced tonight we must have some showers. It is pitted about two hours earlier, then it is topped. 
and if you look on this tree you can see lots of white spots on it and my guess is these are droppings either from these vultures or other stalks that we call the marabou stalk so the white coloration there is not part of this tortured tree it's just some droppings from buds and more so these big raptors or these big buds are the vultures or the marabou stalks these particular vultures always move in twos, a male and a female, but apparently there's one here. Are you trying to yawn? What do you want to do there? But knowing vultures, how they scavenge or when they go eating what has been left behind by the predators, you notice she doesn't have any feathers on her head because the moment they dig in or they drive their heads through, the carcass they'll pick so much blood so if the f head would have been covered with feathers that could be a disadvantage and normally that would give them a lot of well not diseases but it's not healthy for them to pick up all that blood on their head very strange she's alone we'll always see them once in a while alone but what i've learned or seen in experience they'll always go in twos male and female Ravinda, the Nubian vultures in general, that is their color. I don't think it's the blood, but that is how its skin looks like. When young, it's always dark, but as they mature, all oh, the Nubian vultures or the lapid faced vultures have that color. I do not think it's blood, but that's always the skin or the look or the color of the skin of the lapid faced vultures. James, do you think the sun is going down? If I may request you to go slowly and quietly to the left and see the sun going home i don't know why the vulture went down there but if it, my head is out of the way the sun is slowly dipping there and what a beautiful sunset and i hope you're enjoying that sunset ravinda and oh yes and uh, yeah lou thinks that's quite magnificent I might have a moment of silence for 10, 15 seconds for myself also to enjoy the sunset. That is an amazing sunset. And notice how quickly the ball goes down. And hopefully we're gonna see it again maybe another 12 hours from now to tomorrow morning. And that is very nice. I've been able, when I was watching the sunset and thinking how the sun goes down and comes up tomorrow morning, I've been able to locate the other vulture. And James, if you go to that tree there, if you go to that tree there, that's where the other vultures is. I was talking about these vultures always going in twos. So that is the other partner of this one. And it's not only me in the Maasai Mara, Kenya, who have a sunset. No, it isn't. And I think we might be in the lead for the best sunset this evening. What do you think, Senzo? Senzo has requested, now if there are any water back in the area, if you could please walk from the left hand side of the screen, pause briefly, turn and look, and then continue straight off to the left out of frame. What did I say? No, it must come from the right. So it must come from the right, walk to the left. That would be great. Uh, we don't need to worry about doing a moment of silence because we've got no birds or anything chirping. You can just hear the wind blowing around. So. Luckily, you had a chance <clears throat> to listen to the sounds of the wilderness with David. But this, in my opinion, has to be one of the prettiest sunsets I've seen here in the Sabi Sand. And we're lucky enough to see so many. I mean, we get to see them all the time. But especially with the colours and the skies starting to turn. Do you know what I'll do for you, Senzo? Because I see you quite high up. Let me, if, if I go for a little bit forward in this dip, what do you think? Then we can get away from these branches I'm gonna quickly do a little bit of maneuvering we're gonna have another look okay 
Okay, let's see now. We've changed the angle slightly. Senzel's leveling the camera. Here we go. Still gorgeous. Gorgeous? I don't know why I added a T on the end. Oh no, it's because I'm Turtle Taylor now. <laughs> oh no, just get rid of me. I've lost my mind. Oh, I'm my Terrapin Taylor. Sorry, I'm Terrapin Taylor, not Turtle Taylor. Oh well, I tried. But that is absolutely gorgeous. And you know what? Sometimes taking a picture or even watching something on screen doesn't quite do it justice. Because there's colours that are in the sky that we just aren't even able to pick up. I mean, the blues, the pinks. It looks very orange. Even when I took a photo as we arrived, obviously I took a picture. Um, it's also it very, very orange. But what I can see with my eyes is even better. I might even have to take a picture on my mobile device and then share it with you all later. Oh, sense on my phone says my storage is full. Very upsetting. Oh, well. That's okay. That's lovely. Good. I'm glad you're all sending in your screenshots. Remember to hashtag Safari Live and Believe Louise and also Turtle Taylor. Terrapin Taylor. I can't remember which one I am. Turtle Terrapin Taylor. Wonderful. Right, Senzo, let's go. We're going to watch. We'll start again. We'll climb to the top of that hill and then we'll get it all over. We won't get the beautiful Maruda trees um, silhouetting against the sun, but that doesn't matter. It is the bottomless sunset, yes. For $9.99, you can get a bottomless sunset. How does that sound? Is that a kind of special that you would all like? <laughs> I know I would. Oh, this is nice. Different view. See, this, we're just going to go drive further and further, not further, closer and closer to the sunrise. That's nice. I like this one better. But I'm too close to take a picture now. Maybe one illegal photograph. Let's see. Okay, I'm going to risk it. Two. Excuse me. Sorry, you know, allergies at this time of the year are really terrible. Really, really bad. Thanks. Louisa said, bless you. She knows. The amount of times I have to run back to camp to put eye drops in, antihistamine eye drops to stop my eyes from itchy. itching is um, far too high. But that is gorgeous. Just imagine this was the scene we had with that pearl-spotted owlet. We had one the other night silhouetted against the sun. It was absolutely gorgeous. Now this would be even better if we could get something like, like that. But I don't see any birds that we can use or any animals that we can use as props. <laughs> Thankfully the trees can't move. <clears throat> so we can just shuffle around them. No, Louise, because we already spoke about the McCurdy, uh, oh, what was that tree called that I gave the name this morning? McCurdy, uh, Ripopensis is the species of tree that I tend to climb. I'm not ruining another pair of shorts, that's for sure. <laughs> Seems like we were laughing today. Hard. Sorry, I'm putting my mic pack back in. Ah, oh, they are animals. Come on. Get over here. They're far away though, they're Nyala. Nyala, by the time you get here, it'll be tomorrow. They're moving so slowly. They didn't get the memo apparently. Okay, we'll have one more look. Ooh, I'm just gonna put my foot down the accelerator quickly. Okay, hold on tight. Oh, I really wanted to get a gap, a clear gap. Okay, I'm gonna go around. We're just going to park up there. It's going down so fast. Yeah. I'm just going to pull off the road slightly. And there it goes. About to disappear. Please tell me I win the award for best sunset. Not that there is actually any prizes, but bragging rights. I will walk around the entire camp boasting this evening about how our sunset was just so spectacular. I'm going to say it so often it's going to annoy everyone in camp. <laughs> Ooh, we're doing a poll. That's exciting. Is it between David and I? Because 
Steve is preoccupied with the buffalo, which is pretty cool though. Next time, Steve Volvo, next time you can play the game. Luckily, Steve is a good sport, so he won't be too sad about <laughs> participating in this competition. But stunning nonetheless. Yeah, really? That's that's totally the best sunset I think I've ever seen. I know I said that once about the sun setting behind the Drakensberg Mountains, which was absolutely gorgeous. But the fact that we got that marula tree and there were like two trees that were just perfectly placed. They were unbelievable. And I look forward to seeing all your screenshots. Right, now speaking of Steve and Buffalo, it seems as though he's still with them. I wonder if that young calf is still trying to do a handstand. Yeah, well, the handstanding buffalo has since moved off. And here we have got one of the oldest bulls in the herd. But just a note on Taylor's amazing sunset. We didn't get to see it, but by the length of which you were with her, it must have been sensational. And there you can see that bull who's not looking at us now. Well, kind of. He's got a very broken open boss, which means it's split and just bigger and bigger and bigger. And the ends of the horns are kind of worn down. You see those colors on the boss itself there? That's some thrashing bushes and branches in their never ending quest to eradicate horn borer moths and to also strengthen their head and their neck. And he is probably on his way out as terms of Dugger Boys go. Him with his older brothers, all the biggest and oldest in the herd, maybe not the biggest anymore, but the oldest most certainly, they'll move off and form their own Dugger Boy group of bachelor boys and make room for the boisterous young males, if we can find one or two of them. There we go, and there's a couple on the side here. There's one young male on the right, there's a female in the middle and another young male on the left. You can just see the size difference in the horns. He's still quite small, this guy. Much smaller than the one we saw just before, but still growing. And they start getting very boisterous and pushy shovey, do buffalo. And that is what eventually tires out. Just over here, V, under the dam cam, you can see there's two having a little bit of a go. Yeah, straight in there, to the right. Yeah, there we go. You see those two having a little bit of a shove as that female walks past. And it's non-stop. Oh, she's going to stop right in the way. How, how rude. Madam, we're trying to talk about the people behind you. There we go. And she's going to move. So it's a non-stop push and shove affair for buffalo. And there those two are not having a very big go at it. But it does become very boisterous at times, especially when the females are breeding. And you can see how they're able to aim the, the ends of those horns towards each other. And that big powerful boss is uh, where the impact takes place because they do hit each other's heads not like battering rams that you see in uh, in some of those sort of mountain like elk I'm trying to think what they're called again the Ethiopian mountain goats or whatever they are they hit each other on the head I don't think buffalo really smash each other come running and smash it's more of a push and a shove and who can outmaneuver the other one with strength in the neck and obviously body weight is a very very big um, a sort of addition to that, like a scrum in rugby. Any of you enjoy rugby? The South African rugby team beat the New Zealand team just on Saturday. Highlight of the year. We haven't beaten New Zealand at home since 2007 or 9, I think. 2009. That's a very long time. Those of you who don't like rugby, I'm sorry to be boring you with this information, but a scrum is essentially the, the big eight guys in the team versus the other eight who basically their objective is to bash their heads against each other and then try to win, compete for the ball. And the entire scrum of eight people, the entire scrum of eight of the biggest people South Africa, New Zealand, England, Australia could produce, all of them fit into one of these individual buffalo. Can you imagine? So these two buffalo pushing each other are essentially between the region of 800 and 1,000 kilograms. And the average scrum is on the average between 900 and 950 kilograms. So that is why I mention it, because the power of that, if you can imagine just three of the biggest human beings you've ever met pushing you, well, that's only a third of what the buffalo can produce. It's nice to put that into, sort of, into some sort of comparison. 
so we can realize how powerful and strong these animals really are. And as docile as they look right now, enjoying themselves in the water, some of them even going so far as having a little bit of a swim. They're very docile now, but when it comes down to it, they're competing for females, they can get quite grumpy. And when a lion decides that they would like buffalo for dinner, well, I've seen a lioness that weighs 135 and 40 kilograms, so what's that, 300 pounds, getting lifted 10 feet in the air by a buffalo from the ground. That's incredible. Imagine throwing an animal that big into the sky, not just lifting them off the ground, but completely doing a, an arc in the air before landing. I don't think that lioness survived. Well, that is it. I talked about the arms race earlier. It's all about the competition. Buffaloes have become very adept at protecting themselves and obviously also formed these herds which make it a bit easier to protect themselves. More ears, more eyes, that confusion element, assistant protection of the youngsters. And it's always that very hard time I suppose for those males when they eventually leave, become the Duggar boys on the outskirts. They just hope that when they leave there's enough of them. So it's not just one. You often find, I've found up to 20 Duggar boys together and then one by one they get whittled down. They're quite enjoying this Monday afternoon by the pan. Not one of them looked towards the sunset, I might add. <laughs> they were too enjoying the moisture. The cool afternoon breeze, it's changed from a dry, warm breeze to a, a more cooler breeze. Hello Minamu, you want to know how buffalo cope? Well, during droughts it's the same as all animals do, they, they have to move. Um, the reason, I mean, we've spent a lot of time with the migration up in Kenya, those animals, those wildebeest and zebra move and they migrate because of food. Uh, buffalo in and around the Kruger Park have got these sort of smaller migration routes, by no means migration in the, in the form of the Serengeti Masai Mara migration, but it used to happen, you used to get migration happening. I can see Taylor waving at us in the distance there, just about to clear the, clear the road, there she goes. And there's the ever colourful Senzo Mkise, who no doubt is going to give us a nice wave now. There we go, the Queen's wave. So buffalo, what they have to do is they move. So they need water, so you're going to find them always coming back to a source of water, twice a day at least, and then they'll move into areas where there's forage. And um, uh, most of the time you'll find the buffalo, like there was absolutely no buffalo here in summer. They all moved towards the sweet felt, towards the east. That's what I'm assuming. I didn't actually follow the records too much, but that's what they'll do. They'll go to an area where there's lots of grazing, lots of grass, the wildebeest, the zebra, even the elephant go there and then they feed at their leisure as much as they can. They get up, pick up their bulk, they get strong, they compete. Uh, the females give birth and then slowly but surely they move around the reserve and they pick up on pockets of vegetation that has been sitting idle. And where we are here in the western side of the Kruger, we've got more of like an overwintering sort of vegetation. The grass isn't sweet. It's regarded as pretty sour, but there's pockets down in and around the drainage lines that after the rainfall we had this year, Produced quite a lot of grass and uh, that is what the buffalo are now doing they're moving through the drainage depressions as with most animals you'll find them in the drainage areas looking for the longer sweeter grass that's left over it's quite dry so they just got to grin and bear it really mean a move there's nothing they can do about it the weak will get whittled off and die and the strong will move through the ranks and breed and that is the sort of the cycles of life here drought is a natural occurrence it's just the, the lack of food due to extensive droughts and the increase in water points that can potentially lead to more deaths in a drought. But hopefully these guys are going to do well. They're looking pretty good. But it seems like Taylor's on a mission somewhere. Let's go and see exactly what she's looking for. We are on a mission to find Louise's fake lions. Are you ready to help me find them? Because I'm going to need some help. So. I don't really know where to look, but we're driving on a Mvubu road at the moment, heading back towards uh, Bufflesock Boundary, and then I think we'll... See, I don't know. I don't know if I should check all the way down Bufflesock Boundary to see if those lions maybe crossed up this side. Maybe that's why the buffalo came back. Maybe they went, what? Nope. 
big cats that side and then we're like we're safer here by the water little do they know Hosanna is a very keen buffalo hunter although has he yes yeah, he successfully brought down one buffalo calf if I'm not mistaken but um I've seen him stalking them a number of on different occasions this is a few months back when he was even smaller than what he is now so who knows maybe next we'll have Hosanna in a tree with a baby buffalo tomorrow keep an eye out on the damn camp <laughs> That could be quite interesting to watch. So I think, we, actually, you know what? We're going to take the fire break. We'll drive on the fire break because no one ever drives on the fire break and it'll give my really poor eyesight a chance at spotting um, the tracks and what little light we have left. So we'll give it a bash. And then hopefully we'll either find footprints or we might also do some stopping and listening and uh, see if we can't hear the leons. Well, that's the idea behind it anyways. Okay, true, now we scan, now we look all over to try and find these animals. Maybe we get some hy hyenas too, sorry I had a fly in my hand so I shoot it. Maybe, maybe not Louise, I don't know. I've had enough of leopards, we've seen too far too many, of course. <laughs> I'm joking. Of course I'll go to Hosanna. I'll probably end up just going there because I know I'm not going to find. I'll put it in a little bit, a little bit later. We want to, we'll at least give the lion search a bit of a bash. Mm. Just lots of old wild dog tracks around here because this is where they had been hanging around. See, the other thing is that Tamboti Dam is, you can't see it, but it's just over there. I, I would love to just creep up onto that wall to find out if there is any water inside. Okay, we're just going on a bumpy bit. Oh my goodness gracious, that's a big bump. Francis, is it Francis from Israel? It did hurt a little bit, thank you Louise. Or is it just Francis, not Francis from Israel? Ah, anyways, I thought it was my old friend, but anyways, just Francis. Um, the Nkumas are somewhere on Aratusa. Apparently they have a kill. That's what I've heard. I don't know what they killed or where exactly they are, but they're to the west, to the west, where the sun sets down to the west. Now Senzo's singing a tune there. <laughs> this is a very bumpy road. I need a seatbelt. No, Louise, that doesn't go with what we were singing. She's just trying to ruin our, our song now. Woo! Only, only 68% of you thought that I had the best sunset. Best some of you book an appointment with the optometrist immediately. Hey, Senzel, only 68% thought that that was... That, they thought... Well, it's the other 32%, but they thought that um, David's was good. I didn't see what David's looked like. I was so biased and only like mine, as I normally do. <laughs> also, I'm just joking. Please don't hate me. Just in case, I'm sorry. Hashtag sorry, not sorry. Um, so I'm going to just keep driving now. I have not. I've also not been looking for lion tracks. Those are massive hyena footprints, which you won't be able to see very well because it's... Uh, it's getting dark now. Okay, we're going through another very bumpy area. Hold on. Hold your TVs still. <laughs> I think my dad is also watching and I bet he's just also, sh he's doing the James head shake of disappointment. Going, those, those jokes are not funny, Taylor. <laughs> I'll get a stern talking to when I go home next. At least, Louise laughs at my jokes and sends all chuckles every now and then, so my ego's fine. <laughs> and then for the rest of you, I'll just think it, you'd think that I'm hilarious. Okay. Oh, Senzo, straight or left? Straight or left? Straight. Okay. Senzo says we go straight. Well, the buffalo have been around here because their hooves have been all over the floor and around. Okay, you guys are stuck with me for a little while. Enjoy the ride. 
Right, we're just going. We're driving into the sunset, but that's not really where the sun sets. Sunset a little bit further to the west. To the west, to the west. We need to finish that song because it could be a really good tune, a catchy one, I think. I'm gonna think of some some more lyrics that could go along with that. Okay, now we get to a, a bit of a tricky part because the ground becomes a bit harder. But luckily, I wasn't looking over there, so we'll just check over here where the sand is now soft for those lion tracks. And then I think when we get to the top of this sort of incline, we'll we'll stop and have a listen. The moment I can just hear little squeaks. Sounds like I've got little birds under the hood of my car. They've all stopped tweeting now. Okay. Shall we stop? Let's listen. Because my eyes apparently aren't working today. I'm doing the James. James does this, I don't know, he pushes his ears forward. And he cups his hands behind them like this and I think it helps him here. Maybe he presses a button, he turns the volume up. <laughs> Only saying that because he's not here to defend himself. <laughs> Nothing. Wind. Lovely. At least it's not blowing a hurricane anymore. Definitely calm down a little bit. So I think we'll have a nice still evening later on. You know what I do need though? I need some chapstick. Do I have any emergency chapstick in my box of tricks? Probably not. But after today's wind, whew, of course not. I've got lots of things in here, Louise. Oh, I have a bangle. Look. Okay, let's play a game. Let's see who's awake still. Where does this bangle come from? And what colors and symbol does this represent? It should be fairly easy. Are you trying to trick them now, Senzel? They'll never know. One more time. There we go, how great is that? <laughs> We're just joking, of course. Where do you think that's from? Hashtag Safari Life, let us know. I was going to demonstrate on how I get it onto my hand. Oh, this one I might be able to. I can't, I need the dishwashing liquid. Yes, now I'm a classic safari female safari guide i need a few more bangles though tomorrow when i do safari i'm gonna have bangles from here all the way up since wants me to put both my hands up and then i'm gonna point i'm gonna move this one this one says taylor because i forget what my name is sometimes so when louise goes please remember to introduce yourself and you see me go Hello everybody, my, you know, no I'm joking, I don't do that. Sometimes I forget my name though. Um, I now also want to take this off, but I know I'm not going to be able to take it off until I get home. I'm not going to wear this one. I'll change it up. Maybe I'll get rid of this one and put this one on. Yes. Fresh new trends. <laughs> I don't know. Too good. Senzel's also trying to flip his hair. Senzel's got this really cool little side pony going on. Anyway, Steve has not moved from the buffalo. But it sounds like he's switched cameras or something along those lines. Let's go find out what's up. Yes, we have indeed. Thank you, Taylor. VM is the genius when it comes to fixing things. And he, he changed something and fixed the camera we've been using the whole afternoon and just wanted to test it. And now we've got the normal camera on Wendy with the Fleur, the Fleur thermal camera. So we're back to our normal sort of Wendy operation. And we've still got those buffalo. Yes, all slowly moving away from the watching hole, back in the direction they came. We also were about to leave and head towards Hosanna, but then after seeing Taylor, I had the feeling that she's probably heading in that direction. If she is not, we shall quickly head in that direction ourselves, but otherwise we will stay with these buffalo for a moment longer before maybe moving off and seeing what other nocturnals we might be able to find ourselves. But after drinking, the only thing they're really going to do now is probably find a nice comfortable place to sit down and bed for the night, or for a few hours anyway. They've probably been feeding on grass for the longest time. 
and now it's time with the water in their bellies to then go through the process of ruminating all of the dry grass that they've managed to accumulate for the day. Very nice meditative state. These ones though are quite enjoying their dipping pool. The plunge pool offered by the lodge, free of charge to the animals of course. And interesting though, isn't it, that right here next to the watering hole, there is still some grass that the animals are feeding on. Should we check? You want to know if waterbuck have bigger horns than, than buffalo? Most certainly, it seems to be much bigger. Uh, the length of them, anyway. Oh, water buffalo. I've, I don't know. I don't know about the difference between water buffalo and Cape buffalo. They do look slightly different, and from the pictures I remember seeing, I don't recall um, water buffalo looking like they've got the really big boss that you find on a big Cape buffalo bull. Maybe more similar to the females, but then I really don't know. Maybe one of the viewers out there has got an exact comparison size difference for us. You can send that through to hashtag Safari Live or just pop it in on the YouTube stream. Um, but one by one down in the little depression there, we've got at least one or two buffalo lying down. Slowly starting to get ready for the night. The lead buffalo or two have decided, well, we've now had our water. Let's have a little bit of a break. And the heat of the day has definitely dropped off quite a lot, which is really, really nice. Much more comfortable than it was. Oh, definitely more than 60 buffalo here, if you give a quick little scan. Enormous amount of them. In fact, look at all of them there, filling the whole basin. Strength are in their numbers, as you know. And you can see the youngsters always kind of in the middle, never on the outside of the herd. You can see again there, another one just tucked up in the middle there, another youngster on the right, always kind of in between mum and a few others. That one's having probably its early days of, of proper feeding. Spent most of its time uh, suckling up until probably a month or two ago. Now, well, it has to do what the rest do and go, well, I've got to chew on this dry grass, which is not very good. I think we've gone into IR there, V, have we? The light is surely fading. And as as we said that, the, the lights of the lodge and the dam cam all just sort of materialized on as that all happened. Very good. There we go. And one lone Niala bull has come down to try and get a drink. It was difficult before. You can see the buffalo looks at him with just a little bit of interest. There's really no competition between the two. They might have a little bit of a... <laughs> Everybody's trying to count. I gave up trying to count. Anyway, the, buff the, the Niala is just being watched now. I think he should realize that he's actually quite safe with this amount of buffalo around because they would spot something, but it's just that, you know, that, that that sort of protection status, that sort of, that's what keeps them alive, you know, as soon as they drop their guard, well, they're goners. And he finally managed to find a gap in the herd of buffalo, and now it's his turn to come down and drink. And from a competition point of view, they would feed on similar sort of grass material, and Yala being able to, to feed on the leaves and the browse, and to feed a little bit lower in the vegetation as well feeding on the fruits, the fallen leaves, a little bit more selective mouth parts, both ruminants. There we go, a little bit of argy-bargy. <laughs> Even the guinea fowl are coming in now from the back. And just see the size comparison between the guinea fowl and the buffalo. Puts it into a bit of perspective. There is the light on the dam. One of our nest cams. And the buffalo has just very rudely chased away the guinea fowl, being seed eaters. If 
eating a lot of grass, they also get very, very thirsty. Very commonly find them this time of day coming down to drink. There we go, we got a little bit of boisterous buffalo action towards the right there, V. Nothing too boisterous. It's a little bit of a, a push and a shove. Constantly bonding, constantly competing within the herd. It's the strongest males that will breed. Strongest males force themselves through the herds and follow the females around when they are in estrus and smell the urine. And if there's any challenger nearby who would like to smell the same urine, well, he has to deal with the bigger of the two, or the bigger of the two will generally stake claim. You can see two large bulls again. And you just see the size of the boss on those horns. Makes it so much more easier to compare them with the females. Minamu, most certainly, female buffalo, that's why they have horns. They will turn on a lion, a jackal, a hyena, anything like that that happens to threaten the herd. The, the babies, that is. The general rule when we look at it, you know, you look at Nyalas, the females don't have horns. Um, their habitat is more of a thick environment where their strategy of survival is to stand very still and to camouflage in with the background. Whereas you look at, so that kind of is the, the strategy for all of your, your animals with horns that are only the male. The male uses the horns for fighting, kudu, Nyala, Impala, Bushbuck. Uh, but the females don't need them for fighting and they don't need them for defending their youngsters because their strategies are different. And then you look at all your open plains animals, um, wildebeest, hartebeest, springbok, buffalo, eland, more hot open plains areas, they can't really stand and hide from a predator. So very often they have to turn and fight them off. And that is why the females have developed the horns. You can imagine being a female kudu running around through the thickets here with horns that are not needed. That's just an encumbrance, it's difficult to survive and it's only the males who use them for fighting and for breeding that allow them to obviously go through in the genetics but from the female point of view they are completely useless. But the buffaloes, see there's a female there. You see the boss is not developed at all, it's quite hairy but those horns are still very very powerful. She's still a very powerful animal, nowhere near as big as the male but she's still flat in the lion or a hyena, anything that threatens her offspring and that is the purpose of the horns. Quite a nice general rule to think about when you look at animals. What is the purpose of that? And if it doesn't have a purpose it will slowly evolve out. Okay well we're going to move off from this buffalo shortly and I believe Taylor McCurdy is still on the search for her lions. Yep, 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 yep. That's exactly what we are doing. We are searching for lions. I don't know why I've got the giggles this afternoon. It's ridiculous, but uh, I can't get rid of them. It's like I've eaten something funny and uh, it's, the side effect is giggles. Anyways, whew, take a deep breath. Right, um, so no luck on any lion tracks whatsoever all the way down the fire break. And I promise you, I did start looking carefully, but I didn't see any signs. So now we're back on Via Teller Access and I'm scanning, maybe looking for chameleons, potentially bush babies, maybe a civet because Tristan has seen one running up and down Via Teller Access a couple of times. That would be really cool. Um, no, I don't think I'm going to end up at Hosanna, sadly. So he is welcome to go back there. I just think I don't even know where he was. So. Yeah, Senzo wants to see his favorite animal. He's been very strict with me this afternoon. It's been quite hard to work with. I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm really teasing. No, Senzo and I have been speaking about finding lions. I don't know, since I, since I got back, hey, we've been saying, when are we going to find lions? So for those of you that don't know, the lion is uh, Senzo's favorite animal. It's my favorite big cat too. So I'm always thrilled in trying to find um, some lions. And I'm particularly fond of the Inkahuma pride too, which is normally our, normally our resident pride, although they don't seem to like us anymore, they've ventured off. But 
with all the buffalo around, they're going to start loving us soon. Da, 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 loving it. Well, they'll be singing that song, I won't be. And um, anyways, so if you hear lions roaring to that tune, then you know. Oh, well done, everybody. Well done. I had no one fooled, apparently. You all guessed that my bangle is from Kenya. I've now switched it. I took the old one off and put this one on. It's a bit big, though. Can you get, can you get them tailored? Where, do, you, do you take it to a jeweler? A beader? I don't know what the correct term is, but I need to get a few of those rows out. Not that it's going to fall off of my wrist, but it's very loose. Oh, well. It'll give me something else to play with. I'm a fidgeter, so whenever I talk, I'm the most annoying person in the whole world. I don't do it while I'm live, but when I have normal conversations with normal people, do you think I can be normal? I play with my rings, I play with my necklace, I twist my hair, I play with the beads on my bangle. I can't help myself. Anyways, so <clears throat> we'll just check around here for any animals, and hopefully we'll find some of them. I, I can't believe we're not seeing chameleons yet. It also feels like somebody's turned the heater on in this car. <laughs> Did you also feel how warm it got all of a sudden? Am I just having a moment? I don't know. <laughs> it just got very warm. It did get very warm, eh? Whew. There we go. Louise has just said she's brought my age into it again. I wish that would work if I could shine the bright light at the camera and it would blind you all, but it doesn't work like that. Anyways, well, not all of you, just Louise. So, so yes. No, it's war. It's like real. It's like a hot. It, it, the engine is obviously very hot. But I don't know. No, Louise, I'm not going to bring my spotlight because I'm going to blind Senzo. And I, I like Senzo. So, I'll just have to wait till I get back to camp. You saw what she did to me if you were following Louise's takeover on the Safari Live Instagram page. Also, if you haven't been following that, best you get on it because it's hilarious, the Insta stories. Um, everyone gets a chance to do a takeover on the weekends. So keep really funny and smart and all these things as she basically had a go at me about my flat tire. It's just, it's a slow puncture. That's all it is. Anyways, and uh, she made a comment and then I just took the compressor and went in her face she got a fright she almost fell over i kind of wish she had fallen backwards it would have been really funny it would have made the video 10 times funnier so yeah it's not a chameleon it's a leaf i thought i haven't got my chameleon spotting eyes <laughs> haven't got my chameleon eyes on just yet it'll take me a couple of goes before i can start spotting them although Maybe they just don't like it because there's no leaves around. No, man, it has got warmer. All the, the wind, I'm now driving. I don't know what's just happened, but all of a sudden it's got uncomfortably hot. Maybe it's because of all the lights on me. I wish they were tanning lights. Man, I'd be so bronzed. Louise is being ugly to me again, in case you're wondering. Oh, I'll just tell all the viewers, Lou. We'll see. We'll see whose side they choose. <laughs> okay, but this is also a great spot for bush babies. I can't believe we haven't been seeing any bush babies. I don't know where they all are. I mean, at this time of the year, it's fairly easy to spot them bouncing from tree to tree. But nothing. Maybe a genet. Genets would be great to see now again for the same reason because it's so open so we could see them quite nicely sitting up on top of the tree. Senzo, are you looking out for honey honey badgers? Didn't you see one this morning, Senzo? You saw a honey badger, but no one else saw it because you're too good at spotting things and everyone's too slow at turning around. I know the feeling, I'm also too slow. I haven't seen a honey badger in such a long time. I can't actually even rem No, I lie. Remember we saw one in quarantine. Tears from a dream. I also love bush babies. I hope they're happy tears from a dream. They're not sad. Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry. I should... <laughs> that was such a bad mistake. <laughs> what 
and my hair was tickling my face, so I was trying to get the piece. And then I pressed the brakes as we went over the bum and then proceeded to smack spotlight in my face. I don't know, did you hear that? No, you didn't hear the that sound my jaw made. Oh, I got a boo-boo now. My chin. I my chin. I've got to go home. Good night, everybody. I'm injured. I can't carry on with the safari. <laughs> Louisa is terrible. <laughs> Right, let's go. I think we should have should go into quarantine and have a look there and try like that side because I don't know if we're going to win with the with the lines. It doesn't seem like we're going to win. I think we're going to drive this side of quarantine though. We're going to go to the most western corner of it and then head all the way along the southern edge and then back up to the bush baby trees near the bush bry site. We've seen a couple of bush babies around there fairly often. So maybe, just maybe, they'll still be around. Now, Steve has not found Hosanna. I didn't go looking for Hosanna. Will Steve find Hosanna? Let's go find out. <laughs> we haven't. No. He, um, we found his hyena friend. A hyena that always likes to come and sort of look at him and say hello. Um, but uh, he moved off. We found the hyena and so I'm guessing we might be just behind Hosanna moving off. I think maybe we check one more time there V. What do you reckon? One more time around the corner and then um, well that's what we got the thermal camera for. The FLIR is very helpful. Difficult to do it though when we're live to, f to scan because then all of you viewers back home will get a little bit sick because of the, the angle of the camera and the movement of the bushes. So do a little bit of spotlight now, sit the spotlight now, see if we can spot him if he moves. The wind is coming from this side, so I would expect him to move slightly towards the wind. I know there's a lot of people out there that disagree with me, but let's see. Even James disagrees. That's all good. We all have our own opinions. And through experience, I've noticed lots of cats moving with the wind. Maybe he's decided it's time to get up and go and find those buffalo, which are not very far away for a cat. They can move quite quickly. Now, well, this is where we went in. He's not over here, so who knows where he could be. Just a few minutes too late, I think. If we were a little bit earlier, we might have, might have got him before we got up, but the weather it's improved, it's gotten much nicer. Hang on, let's go. Which way? No, let's just go this way. Keep heading up. Maybe he'll come through on this other side coming up. I don't think he's hungry, but opportunistic, you know, that's just what it is. He'll always catch something if he can, but he's been close to the pan, so he's probably had his, his, his drinking, or he would have got up and walked past it now and then maybe just lying up in the thicket. No, I didn't see him. That is what happens. Maybe he feels like drinking buffalo infested waters. So maybe we'll go back around to Voyatella and see if um, maybe he's popped out on the other side to have a look and a sniff at the buffalo and uh, maybe taste the residuals of the water that they've left behind. I've seen buffalo many occasions defecating and urinating in their water source. Dr. Lexi, I've never been attacked by buffalo. No, not, not yet, hopefully never. Um, in a vehicle, you know, I've had them come pretty close, but <laughs> I'm terribly sorry. I'm gonna work on my, my earpiece when I get home to camp. I'm getting certain break up things, but have I ever seen a leopard take down a buffalo? No, I've never seen it. I've had um, leopards scavenging on young buffaloes. Whether they caught it or not, it's hard to say. I wasn't there. I didn't see it happen. But it's possible for a leopard to take a buffalo out of a herd. But you saw that herd earlier. 60, 70, 80 strong leopard come in, take a buffalo. Run. It's doable, but um, it's not easy. And if it did take down a youngster, the youngster would probably be of quite low ranking. A very old female or low-ranking female and then the herd really wouldn't do too much to defend it sounds quite sad but if the queen the matriarchal buffalo one of them there's a number of them that dominate 
if one of their youngsters get taken down, well then it's a battle royale as all of the buffalo gather together to try and destroy that um, threat as quickly as possible. But no, I've never seen it before. I've seen a leopard take down a baby zebra. That was that was pretty sad, if you must say. Pretty sad for the mother indeed. But then when it comes to leopards on Juma, anything is possible. And I do think we've had Hosanna with a with a buffalo, young buffalo, but how he came about it, I don't I don't recall the details. I never saw him with it. I just heard about it and I saw some footage. He might have lost it to some hyena as well at the end of the day. I think sometimes he chases them purely because it's, it's a game. He's tasted them once and he's like, oh, I like the smell of those. Some lone in parlor up ahead here. Let's try not move through them quite quite slowly they seem quite relaxed you can't see them now but I just had a glimpse of them their heads were down I'm just gonna sneak on past the Impala without causing them any alarm hello ladies and you can see them with the infrared and uh, now I wonder if any of you out there can tell me what are the Impala feeding on at the moment I only arrived today and I know the answer. I saw something lying on the floor of the tree that these impala are under. And if, if you recognize the, the base of the tree a moment ago, quite a large tall tree, a very common tree in the area. Tell me what you think these impala are feeding on. They're all gathered around the base of this tree. I went for a run today and I saw a few things that I was like, oh, that's interesting. And here we have the impala feeding on it on the ground. That's how a lot of animals, Minamu, you're asking about how the buffalo survived the drought? Well, the impala have a method as well. But um, we're going to be going back to David shortly, all the way back up in the Masamara, as these females who are looking, who don't seem to be too pregnant, will be popping in a few months. But in the meantime, let's go up to David and see what interesting stories he has for you. It seems like David's interesting stories are for another time. Sorry about his communication technical issues there. I wonder if any of you know what the Impala might have been feeding on hashtag Safari Live. Um, yeah, it is one of those technical things. I'm having a bit of an issue with my ear. We're getting through it. Um, these things happen. Um, these things happen. Uh, probably because it's been sitting on my desk for the last three weeks, two and a half weeks. It maybe just needs. A little bit of TLC, you know, very simple system. But we are just moving through the open area of quarantine, and now that we have passed the Impala, we can get the spotlight back up again. More Impala, lots of Impala through here. Cal 6, it was not jackalberry fruit. No, that was not a jackalberry. Um, but good guess, though. Good guess, though. A few weeks ago, it's exactly what they were feeding on. A lot of the animals were feeding on the jackalberry fruits. But now it's spring. Um, the jackalberries have an interesting strategy. They can fruit a couple times a year. It's not always at the same time in winter and summer. So they provide a nice food source throughout the year. But now that tree was a marula tree. The marula tree has developed certain things in the last few weeks since I've been away. And I noticed it when I was uh, running today. I saw a whole lot of them on the floor underneath the trees. I wonder if anyone knows. <laughs> Rich, Rich, it was not french fries. A good guess though. French fries, uh, I'm not sure if in a parlor would eat a French fry. What do you reckon it would eat? Tingana would eat a French fry. Oh, he'd, I think Tingana would eat anything you'd give him. <laughs> Only one way to find out. We'll have to 
Now, we don't feed animals. That is not the policy. Feeding of animals is bad. But um, the marula trees at the moment have produced um, their flowers. The flowers have come through and uh, obviously the leaves are not quite there yet and all of them and I saw quite a few of them dropping flowers today. Maybe they aborted the flowers because they haven't had rains um, but it seems to be what the impala were feeding on. Um, I saw a lot of them underneath a lot of the trees that I ran past today. These long flower sort of the actual flower base with the, the stipule and all that but an, a, an unformed flower so the flower with, without opening without pollinating just sort of coming and going maybe there was a lot of wind and they fell down it could be another story that happened maybe they aborted them maybe it was wind it's hard to say it has been quite windy the last couple days I do believe but if you get late rains it's it's, it's common to have um, Marula is losing a lot of flowers and not getting as many fruit as you'd hope they do and uh, on the sort of the local calendar the Shangan calendar which dates back very long time ago before we actually really had a calendar they looked at seasonality and the flowering of the Marulas was a seasonal occurrence for them it indicated the arrival of spring so the Marulas are a very important tree in their calendar and they look at them when they flower they then are able to see how many fruits they're going to see and then in January they the fruits ripen and they are very happy and that is the beginning of their year their harvest time their celebration time and that is obviously when they make all their beer and their jams and all of those interesting things very very important tree out here popped all the way around to avoid okay well we're gonna quickly go over to Taylor who's got a very nice nocturnal animal I cannot believe what we've got here am I going crazy or is this really a southern white face scopsile that I'm staring at that's amazing that's really really quite cool you see the sort of black bands on the side of the face uh, the African scopsile also has them, but not to this extent. It's um, sort of not quite as prominent. But on the southern white face scopsile it is, and they, we're obviously in infrared now, as you can see, in the black and white. I have got my spotlight on it just a little bit because it's quite far away and the infrared lights don't reach that far. But they've got bright orange eyes, and they're the most gorgeous little owl. I think they have to be the prettiest of the little ones. The barred owlet and the pill-spotted owlets always look so angry, whereas these guys don't look as as angry. Oh, there's two! No way, Senzo! That's incredible! Like, that's really, really amazing. I don't think I've ever seen two in my entire life together. How special? Normally you see them in the more sort of forested areas. I've never actually seen them out in the open like this before. The only time I've ever seen them is along river riverine thickets, really and maybe up in a jackalberry you know with lots of foliage but out in the open like this and on an open plain this is typically the habitat of the barred owlet and also the um, and mo more importantly the pearl spotted owlet hang around out here so this is a very very special thing to see wow must be a breeding pair i love the little feathery tufts that they have on the top of their heads too and that will help break up the silhouette of an owl too you see it with the Varose, oh, not the Varose, the Spotted Eagle Owl, quite nicely. The Cape, you all know the Spotted Eagle Owl, not the Cape. DJ, oh, I don't know. I, I just, it's not a common sighting. So I wouldn't say rare as in like, oh my goodness, we just saw an aardvark or a caracal or a striped polecat. You know, something like that is a rare sighting. This is just a, it's just an uncommon sighting. But that is unbelievable. We must keep an eye out and see if they're, off they go and see if they live around here. Very nice. I'm not going to disturb them anymore because I was putting the spotlight on them. I thought I heard a distress call coming from up ahead. So I just quickly want to quickly race and see if I can find it. Imagine we get something incredible for the last little bit of the show. Oh, just going to turn my brights off. Let's see if I can find what I'm looking for. And Parler are looking around. What is it? What is it? Senzo, did you hear that sound? 
like um, searching and searching. It might have been, might have been closer to camp. Let's go. I think that's Steve that's there. Got a bright light. I just want to drive down here towards the tent. What is that? Oh my goodness, La Chupacabra, La Chupacabra. What is that? Oh my goodness. Who have we got there? It's a rare sighting of Byron. <laughs> there he is, everybody. Just in time for the final countdown. It's the final countdown. Do -do -do -do. Da -da 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 -da. Hi. Hello, right. everybody. There we go, everyone. Here's Byron. We've got 30 seconds of the show to go. You made it in time. Made it in time. I thought James has disappeared. I thought I'd come and cause trouble for one night and visit everybody. Yes. Hope you're all well and enjoying the show. We'll see you all soon. Bye. Well, everybody, it's been a fantastic afternoon. I hope that you've enjoyed spending it with us. Lots of things, buffalo, leopards, whiteface scop sounds pretty epic. Join us tomorrow on the Sunrise Safari where it'll all happen again.